Okay, and we are recording. Welcome, everybody, to another episode. This is going to be another reaction video together with uh, myself. I'm, I'm here in Shenzhen, China. Carl Da in Bali. Brian Berletic over in Thailand. So we are filming Tuesday, October 12th at 9 p.m. here, Beijing time. I think it's 8 p.m. over there, isn't it? Isn't that right, Brian? Yes, 8 p.m. Yeah, so you're... Good, good, good. You've uh, so you're an hour before, and we've decided to get together for an impromptu drink. We're gonna have a little bit of a drink. Well, Carl's gonna have juice. It doesn't really count, but <laughs> still, you know, whatever. It, it still works. <laughs> and hopefully, we're gonna have some fun, just like we had last time with the sixty minutes. But hopefully, we'll also get this done in less than three hours, uh, because that was quite a big video. But I was quite pleased with how many people uh, took a look at that. So, if uh, it, just in case everybody doesn't know, I'm sure most people do. Carl Zah has a Silk and Steel podcast that he works on. Uh, great content. Uh, Brian Berletic has the New Atlas YouTube channel. Lots of great geopolitical content on there. Um, ex military, uh, ex ex Navy, Navy, correct? Mar Marine Corps. Marine, Marine, Marine Corps. Right. You're right. Um, so lots of interesting points of view from that perspective as well. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to review. We're going to do a reaction video to something that came from The Hill. The title of that video on YouTube, and we will link to the original video for you, is Kim Iverson. Is the military industrial complex teeing up with uh, World War III with China, comma, Taiwan conflict? So on this show, it has uh, a few different people there. Um, it has Ryan Grimm, Kim Iverson, who's a guest host. She's calling in uh, remotely. And also Emily Jashinsky, I believe her name is. So we're going to take a look at that video and we're going to react to it. Basically, it is Kim Iverson explaining how the Xinjiang situation is not as the mainstream media calls it. And then you see her co-host just looking confused and going into a meltdown. Uh, it's really, really interesting. Uh, you can see how offended they are that she's questioning this. Now, Kim Iverson, I don't agree with all the content she has. She has some stuff that's quite uh, very far off from what I would agree with. But in terms of Xinjiang, she was one of the earliest people who did who put together an epic video in Xinjiang, a really deep dive before a lot of the people, a lot of these news hosts knew anything about the situation. I, if I remember correctly, it was in 2019, uh, 2020, maybe. Um, but anyway, she knows her stuff. I think she was caught a little bit off guard with how they attacked her or kind of reacted. I, I don't think she was expecting that kind of a reaction, but we're going to go through it now and talk about it as we go through it. All right, Kim, what's on your radar today? Well, in the past few days, we've seen increasing reports regarding foul play by China. Reports of ramped up aggressions against Taiwan have been all over the news. Chinese jets menace Taiwan, pressuring U.S. support of islands defenses. Record number of China planes enter Taiwan air defense zone. Taiwan preparing for possible war with China. On top of China's reported military threats against Taiwan, other horrific reports have been coming out regarding the government's treatment of the Uyghurs. Former Xinjiang police officer blows the whistle on mass torture of Uyghurs. The methods included shackling people to a metal or wooden tiger chair, hanging people from the ceiling, sexual violence, electrocutions, and waterboarding. I'm going to pause that there for a second because it's worth mentioning. She didn't go into this. But it was really great that she brought this guy up because this guy has been debunked online over and over again. His story between CNN and the Uyghur Tribunal was completely, I mean, misaligned. You did a, a pretty good video on that. Do you want to mention some of that stuff, Brian? Yeah, I mean, basically, he he testified in front of this thing called the, the Uyghur Tribunal. This was back in June of this year. And... He gave one one story, and then to CNN, he gave a completely different story. So uh, if you look at what he said in June, they, they asked him point blank uh, about these interrogations. And he, he said repeatedly, he said he didn't take part in these inter interrogations. That wasn't his job. He wasn't trained to do that. And this was something that happened at a totally different facility somewhere else. And so he doesn't know. But he, he said that he saw... Uh, abuse. He said he saw abuse, he saw torture, but then they asked him specifically about sexual abuse. And during the tribunal in June, he said he, he never saw it. He never even asked about it. It was, it made him uncomfortable. He didn't even want to ask about it. And now he has all of these details suddenly now that he's talking to CNN and, and then he was just in a sky news uh, video and it was ridiculous. Like they, they show him like putting on his uniform, like they showed up early for the interview and he wasn't dressed yet. And they're like, can we film you getting dressed? 
It's just, it's all theater. And this guy is all, and a lot of people are, are nitpicking about the uniform. And I, I think it's worth investigating. But, at, but then at the same time, it's a red herring because his testimony alone voids his credibility. He has right. no credibility. He told two totally different stories. I, I just like of, that he always yeah. had to put on his uniform in front of the camera. Because how else would he? How would you know he's a Chinese policeman, right? <laughs> just to make sure that you know he's a Chinese policeman. All the interviews, uh, Uyghur Tribunal, Sky News, CNN, he's always wearing the uniform. So like, look, I'm legit. I'm wearing a Chinese police uniform because uh, I, I I post a snarky tweet. I say, you know that because that's how. All escaping Chinese policemen do. They put on their uniform and they get on their flight in Beijing to to escape out of the country, right? I mean, it's totally legit. I, I forgot yeah. to put my Marine Corps uniform on when Daniel asked me about my past uh, <laughs> military <laughs> service. <laughs> that's mean, why you Daddy called you a Navy man. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what ha that's what happens. <laughs> yeah, you. If you had the uniform, I wouldn't have made the mistake. So now we exactly, know that's exactly. why he's got to do this. So yeah. Well, well, what's interesting too is he's covering his face, he's modifying his voice, but he's telling us when he left the force how many years he was in the force, what he did, how many people he arrested. And he thinks the Chinese government can't figure out which overweight police officer with all those details went missing on, on the year that he left. Like, really? Does that does that make sense? Because obviously, I mean, if the uniform's still fitting him, he was that size when he left. Right. I mean, it, it, it just does. It doesn't make any sense. And I, I'm OK with. I'm okay with assuming the uniform is real. I know a lot of people were focusing on the uniform, but it was like we didn't even have to go there. Everything else was so messed up. And also, yeah. just just a FYI for the people who don't know, the for Chinese uh, senior police officers, they they don't get to keep their passport. They, they you know they they have to apply and seek approval to go abroad. You know, it's only when they're they're approved to go they can go visit abroad on tourism. Uh, on tourism uh, reasons, but normally they're they they don't even get to keep their passport. Right. Yeah. One, so one, I mean, they would have known who applied too. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, just one more thing about his testimony back in June, because the the CNN piece came out early this month. So all the way back in June, he was telling the story to the panel, and uh, he he was saying something like. This was about anyone that was involved in like illicit or banned organizations or or activities or religion that was not sanctioned by the government. So he was basically debunking the the idea that this was all motivated by ethnic cleansing. Like they they wanted to get all of the Uyghurs. No, he was he was basically saying that it was a a policy aimed at illicit activity and and banned religious activity. Which is something they're going to get into in this this piece that we're going to watch. They're going to get into that. Right, we, yeah. We're going to talk about that. The 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 cult, uh, the Falun Gong cult, is famous for dressing up in police uniforms and doing these kinds of things. And so, when there was an opportunity to say that Falun Gong people were persecuted in Xinjiang, also, I don't I don't know if there's much if there was ever much of a Falun Gong following in Xinjiang. Uh, but he says yes, they are persecuted also because if he is really one of these Falun Gong guys, I mean, he wouldn't want to miss that opportunity to say. Yeah, actually, actually, they went after them, too. But it, the problem is, is it is it works against him because we're supposed to be saying that they're persecuting the Uyghurs, that they're being targeted. Um, and he messed up on that part. Now, the thing we got to keep in mind is that obviously Kim Iverson can't go into all of this detail on the show. She's got a segment. She's got whatever, five minutes of talking time uh, before they discuss it. So she wouldn't have been able to go into this anyways. But I'm glad that she still put this guy up because this is an absolute ridiculous kind of thing that CNN and the Uyghur Tribunal had put on this, uh, this show for. Um, so let's continue. CNN has been showcasing the Uyghur prison whistleblower all over their newscasts. Various outlets and pundits are now sounding the alarm that we're headed towards war with China. But I want us to take a step back, look at the reality of the situation, and try to learn for once from our historical mistakes. Now, first of all, I think it's important to point out that our nation has been in some sort of perpetual war since World War II, whether it be actual devastating boots on the ground conflicts such as the Korean War, Vietnam War, the various Middle East Wars, the war in Afghanistan, 
or the non-combative yet highly expensive Cold War with the Soviets. We've been a nation constantly needing to flex our military might. Now that the war in Afghanistan is over-ish, our war drums can't but help but to begin beating themselves in a new direction further east. Now, essentially, the military industrial complex needs to continue making money, and nothing could be more lucrative than a new Cold War with China. If you thought the war in Afghanistan was expensive, just wait until the foe we face isn't just a group of unsophisticated tribesmen in the Afghan mountains, but a developed nuclear nation with a population four to five times our size. I'm going to pause that for a second because I want to uh, add in that the profiteering that happens happens before any war actually starts. It's already going on. Uh, the military industrial complex was the winners of the Afghan war, and they're recycling those profits into Aspie and Australia. I know I'm, I'm you know, you, I continually talk about this, but this is a really important point. And they are funding Aspie, who are putting out these China threat stories. And then they convince the Australian government to buy China threat prevention weapons for the China threats that they just finished manufacturing. So she's got a good point. I mean, if it, if it, if it went into an all out war, for sure, there'd be a lot of profiteering. But it's already going on now. And I think that's important to keep in mind. I don't know if you guys had anything else to add or we just continue. Uh, just well, I just. Well, just just to point out that she's talking about all of these wars and and literally every single one of them was was sold to the public based on a mountain of lies. So are we supposed to expect uh, uh, believe that this is the first war that they're telling us the truth about? This is the first time they're they're actually telling us the truth. China is really a threat. It's not it's not a joke this time. This isn't WMDs all over again. This is for real. Are we supposed to believe that? That's just something right. for people to keep in mind. Yeah. And I, I and I think that the one thing that people will say maybe in response to that is saying that just because we're pointing this out, just because we're 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 talking about this doesn't mean we want to go to war. It doesn't mean the two things are connected. Well, I mean, when the U.S. State Department starts funding these narratives to the amount of money that they are in the, in the military industrial complexes, you've got to go with what it always means. I mean, they, they have no problem ignoring atrocities elsewhere in the world. As soon as these groups of people take an interest in a certain supposed thing that's happening somewhere else in the world, you can be sure there's a reason. And it goes it, and it's beyond for human hu humanitarian purposes. Uh, I, I, I say beyond, but, but it's never about that to begin with. I mean, sometimes maybe these things overlap, but that is not the goal here. Um, and that's not the intention. But let's uh, let's continue here. Last month, in preparation for the new ramped up war site set on China, the U.S. announced a new security pact with Australia and the U.K. called AUKUS. It's essentially a new NATO, but rather than counter Soviet expansion, the pact is meant to counter the influence of China in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, remember, the U.S. is all the way over here on the other side of the globe. The U.K. is all the way in Europe and Australia is way down under. And yet these three countries have now gotten together to ensure China doesn't have a growing influence in its own region. The U.S., U.K. and Australia have hundreds of military bases and outposts all around the world. China has fewer than five. Yet the narrative we're all supposed to buy into is that China is the aggressor who must be stopped. Now, China is an economic competitor. That is true. They are growing in economic influence. And sooner than later, it seems inevitable that they will become the, the world's new superpower. That is, unless we can stop them. Now, how can we stop them? Well, history has shown us, as in the case of the USSR, that a nation can collapse when it's forced to focus its time and energy on war. And you don't even have to fire a single bullet to do it. You just need to get them to focus on an arms race while their people starve. So rather than build up our own competitive edge and invest in our country to ensure we nurture the best and the brightest, the strategy in Washington is to instead bully China into giving up their lunch money. It's a losing strategy. The bully never wins in the end. Eventually, everyone grows up, and the smart kid who invested in themselves ends up with all the money, the fast cars, and the nice house, while the bully is still trying to find relevance by talking about how cool they once were back in high school. This is where we're headed. But, can we, but we can only head that way if the American people consent to it. Now, this is where Taiwan and the Uyghurs come in. The players in Washington know the right strings to pull to get the American people to buy into war. It's a little different for the left and the right, but you can easily figure out the trigger points. For the left, it's human rights abuses. The war lobby knows if they use buzzwords like genocide or sexual abuse, people on the left will begin to not only agree with, but demand some sort of military intervention. At a later time, I will go deeper into the Uyghur crisis and explain what's going on. But for now, it's best to stay on high alert when hearing stories that break your heart. 
I want to pause that for a second. There's a guy, um, Midwestern Marks. Um, you probably have seen some of his videos, his TikTok videos that went viral. He talks about U.S. imperialism. He's a young guy. He must be in his early 20s. And um, I was watching some of his videos, and he was talking about how people were criticizing him, saying that you need to believe survivors. You know, how dare you not believe survivors? And these are people who have an appreciation that they've been lied to about WMD and, web, you know, uh, these kinds of uh, different human rights abuses before. So these people are saying they're giving an open invitation to the U.S. State Department saying, listen, we're not going to be fooled by WMDs again or, you know, Gulf of Tonkin. You know, we'll be a little bit more suspicious about this stuff. But you feed us a story and you give us the buzzword genocide. We're going to take it for face value because we can't question survivors. That's that's our weak spot. That's our kryptonite. And so, you know, if, if, if they're going to push this lie, they'll be like, OK, you know, this is all I got to do. I got to put a story out there, add genocide. And I've got everybody on board because they're too afraid to question that. How dare somebody question genocide? I mean, we've got this catchphrase never again. Also, you know, you're going to look like a real idiot if you question this, even though it's completely false. Um, I think I think I think what she's what, the way that she's presented this so far has been really, really well presented. I don't know if you guys have any further thoughts before I continue. Well, I mean, yeah, they're they're saying that the China problem in quotation marks because it's not a real problem. It's a bigger country. They're developed. They should have a bigger economy than the U.S. It's just common sense. And then in order to knock them down a peg, you need to fight some sort of limited conflict. And so how how do you justify doing that without admitting this is just imperialism? You have to make up some reason. So the Uyghurs in Taiwan, this is meant to play on the, the heart, heart strings and the emotions and the anger and uh, in, in many ways, the racism in Western society. Uh, and then, then they get their conflict. They get their containment policy. Right. And there's not, yeah, this absolutely. is nothing new. It's a so-called humanitarian intervention. That started with Yugoslavia, Libya, Syria. It's always the same story. Always, there's always a human uh, that give us some humans, quote unquote, human stories of some suffering little girls, you know, asking for asking for cruise missiles raining down her city, basically, to save them. It's always the same. But this we're, we we had, countless stories have been debunked about Libya, about Syria. But we're now we're being told this time is different when it comes to China. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it, I mean, it, essentially, it's the same playbook, just with um, v uh, different catch words. Um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, that's exactly it. So let's continue from here. We are about a quarter way through. Are they in trial? Are they entirely true? Or is someone trying to get you to pound your own war drum? There are definitely human rights abuses being committed in Chinese prisons. I have no doubt about that. I don't think there's a single prison in the world that isn't guilty of this. But to call what's happening to the Uyghurs genocide or ethnic cleansing is inaccurate. The Uyghurs have been one of the most fertile recruitment grounds for Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. And if we're not careful, we could end up repeating 1980s Afghanistan when we cited and funded the Mujahideen. Now, Taiwan is another complicated issue that isn't very cut and dry, but without hashing out the details of Taiwan and China's entire history and the internal conflict about their status as a nation, let's just address the claims that China's ramping up aggressions by flying its jets in Taiwan's airspace. Take a look at this map. The orange lines are the Chinese flights Taiwan is talking about. The light blue shaded area around Taiwan is their actual airspace. And as you can see, the orange lines are not in that shaded area. So what are all of these reports referring to? Well, they're, refer they're referring to an area titled the ADIZ, the Air Defense Identification Zone. And that zone is the blue dotted line that creates this rectangle, much of which is going on, uh, much of which actually goes right over mainland China. You can see that. I'm going to pause it there. You did a great video, Carl, on this, where you were talking in your reaction video on your channel. You were saying that, you know, the way that they're making this sound is like people are sitting there in Taipei looking above and seeing these chinese fighter jets like look how far that's that's like over half a taiwan away and there's more mainland chinese land in that box than there is taiwan you and know? the the PLA fly path is still closer to the mainland china china coast than anywhere near the island of taiwan itself i mean kim is actually did a great job by presenting this map because this is the first time i've seen a mainstream tv 
sh actually show the map and explain what ADIZ is. I, I, I was invited to appear on RT to talk about this issue. You know, I sent them the tweet from the Taiwan Defense Ministry. I sent them the map. I was very disappointed that they didn't use uh, the material I sent. And, and I only had five minutes to explain and that, you know, I... I didn't realize I only have five minute segment. So so the, the the host cut me off. That's why I, I felt compelled to do my own segment on my own YouTube channel to, to fully flesh out the story and, and to tell people, look, this is just this is just people media once again is whipping up Sinophobia. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing that she got this on there. Um, and these are the no go zones. This is the, the, the real no fly zone here is that this is the no fly zone for you shouldn't be putting these pictures on mainstream media. So you can imagine the two other hosts that are a little bit more traditional. They know what they got to do to stay in business. They're going to want to tear apart Kim when she's done. And then that's exactly what happens. Brian, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to say ADIZs are established specifically in international airspace because they have to be outside of your sovereign airspace. If Taiwan even had their own sovereign airspace, it has to be outside of that for it to even be effective. So when they say you have violated an ADIZ, it means you're just flying in international airspace. And this is something they don't really explain, say like in a CNN article about Taiwan, but if it's about China's ADIZ and America violating it, they're happy to explain it in excruciating detail just so people realize that China's ADIZ means nothing and anyone can violate it whenever they want. That's it's, it's, uh, exactly it, yeah. that's exactly the language they use to describe the U.S. Uh, freedom of navigation patrol. They always say, oh, but we're just sailing in the international water just very very close to your, to your territorial <laughs> waters like That's almost hard. screaming across the edge but we're still in the international water see this is 12 nautical miles exactly from your coast so we're still in the international water that is a really good point yeah. that argument works for them when 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 they want to uh, push a story like that but when this when they're even further away percentage wise from taiwan it's like no 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 you can't use that anymore this should have been a non-story. This should have been a, from an internal point of view, Taiwan sees that, okay, they're in the zone that we monitor, but they've come nowhere close to our actual airspace. I mean, that that's a non-story. That's just a, I, okay, we, I, you know, yeah, go ahead. I, and I want to add to that. The, the reason that put so much focus on this story, so of PLA flying over Taiwan ADIZ, is they don't want to tell you what led up to that. They they, they just want to uh, want you to imagine that you know China Xi Jinping just woke up one day and he decided, okay, this month I'm going to aggressively pressure Taiwan by doing PLA flyovers. What they didn't tell you, what led up to this, is actually U.S. U.S. U.K. Japan and a whole bunch of uh, U.S. vassal states is holding a huge military exercise. Uh, th th with four aircraft strike, aircraft carrier strike groups sailing from Okinawa through through the Bashi Channel between Taiwan and the Philippines, entering entering the South China Sea, just right, uh, right only right after that, the PLA start to in increase the frequency of these flights. It was more to send a message to the United States. You know, because they, they understand that the issue over Taiwan is not really over with issue with we say that the government on Taiwan itself is really an issue between China and United States. And and right. they, they 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 by focusing on the PLA aircraft, they're distracting from the main story. Why is US sending a huge armada into South China Sea? And and there's there's something else to remember is uh Taiwan is part of China. Even the U.S., Australia, the U.K., the AUKUS, they all recognize Taiwan as part of China. And by right, China could fly over Taiwan if they wanted to. But they're not because they're they're dedicated to peacefully resolving this and not provoking a crisis. And then we just found out, I think it was just this week, the U.S. has had U.S. Marines on Taiwan uh, for like a year. Actually, it wasn't news. This was reported last year. So Beijing knew all of this time unless they don't read the newspapers, they yeah. knew about it and they and and they were very patient and mature geopolitically. And the U.S. is still trying to depict them as, um, what did they say in the uh, 60 Minutes Australia, a, a madman with a hatchet or, or an axe or <laughs> with something. With an axe. Yeah, with an axe. Yeah, crazy man yeah. with an axe. 
And the, yeah. <laughs> like if you, uh, I mean, the, the, the PLA fly pass, obviously to challenge the ridiculous Taiwan ADIA zone, but they do it in a very careful, collaborative way by going around corner and edges, you know, not anywhere close to the mainland uh, island of Taiwan itself. It, it's there to send a message like, we're here, we don't recognize your, your, your BS bullshit ADIA zone. And it's also a message to send to the, United States, like, yes, you know, you have aircraft carrier sailing into South China Sea. We have we have coverage from the mainland coast. Our 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 planes could reach you. It's just a, it's a it's a little warning, but but little dial down, you know, very muted caliber. But this is, of course, getting blown way out of proportion in the Western media. And that's why they don't show you that map. So do you think uh Obviously, there's two different things to consider here. One, you know, clipping the edges of this and letting everybody know that, uh, you know, Be Beijing letting everybody know that they don't see this as a legitimate claim um, has some benefit and maybe just showing some force to say, you know, you better not be coming near here. You know, the U.S. US uh, military better not be coming into these zones. Um, which Beijing probably sees as an important message. But as you said, also, when these things happen, it takes away attention from what the U.S. is doing in the South China Sea. Now, even if they weren't doing this, maybe nobody would pay attention anyways. But considering those two things, do you think they're making a strategic error by doing this? Or do you think it's still a, a, a necessary thing that they've got to do? Oh, you mean China? Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, this PLA flight... Uh, over Taiwan ADIA zone happen every time U.S. sell its carrier group into South China Sea. So if you go go search Google the news, you you'll find that whenever U.S. sending the the fleet through that channel between Taiwan and the Philippines through the Bashi uh, channel, chi you will see the news of China uh, PLA aircraft flying over Taiwan ADIA sea zone. So this is like almost like a play, uh, you know, like a calibrated game. Um, but, you know, you, you, again, U.S. media will do what it, 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 it always does. You will blow up everything out of proportion. So I, I don't think China should uh, try to appease uh, the U.S. propaganda machine because that's just a futile effort. And, and, you know, and not you to give that, them any... Sorry, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, Brian. I, I was just going to say, uh, e even if even if China said, OK, let's try to appease the, the U.S. propaganda machine this time, we're not going to fly out. Then they'll be like, China usually flies out. But this time they're quiet, <laughs> always quietest before the quiet, the, before the storm, the, the, calm what before are they the storm. And then exactly. they will say that's because our freedom of navigation patrol worked. Yeah. We convinced yes. the communists yes. to yes. stand you know, you know what? down. You know what? You know what? That we reminds need to do me more. of the story where they talk about like somebody, some journalists are walking through Xinjiang and all of a sudden they saw all these teenagers and they're like, they're like, uh, whoa, look at this. All the Uyghur teenagers are back. And it's like, I was saying, is it like, do they think like Thanos disappeared them and then the Hulk snapped his fingers and brought them back? But then you've got people like no, uh, no opinion. No, uh, what's that guy's name? Noah, Noah Smith. Uh, Noah Smith. Noah yeah. Smith, who you had a debate with. He's coming out saying, wow, did our efforts work? It's like... <laughs> No, they ungenocided they them. Freaking there, and he's like, he, he wants to take credit for this, saying, "Look at this! A, a journalist found all these Uyghur teenagers. You know, our efforts like, worked." It's like Ch China know. obviously uh, imported the uh, the necromancy technology from North Korea. You know how how they how they keep on resuscitating uh, Kim Jong Un. <laughs> so China China just brought back all these dead Uyghur teams back to life to flirt with it, uh, with girls. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it, it's absolutely crazy. But when I asked you that question and you gave me your answer, it made me think something. You know, China often does things and they don't explain it. Oftentimes there's a really good explanation underneath it all. But what this is doing, when you said that when they're flying through this zone, it's always a reaction to something. What they're doing is they're they're writing history for anybody who eventually wants to look back at it objectively you know, right now, of course, nobody's going to see it. Nobody's going to put two and two together. But later on, when people are looking back at this, those facts that you talked about saying they only did this when there were provocations from the U.S., those are going to be solid facts that are very, very difficult to erase. So one day, maybe somebody will want to look back at this objectively. And I found that was the case with a lot of other things 
about China's history that we grow up in the West learning about, oh, this terrible thing they, they, they did during this time. There's all kinds of facts there that are left for you to discover on your own and say, oh, wow, you know what? Actually, uh, it didn't really play out this way. I think Hong Kong is going to be a really good example of that, too. Like, how can you look back, you know, 10 years from now and look at the level of rioting that went on over here? All of my podcast from, you know, your voice is cutting out a little bit for me. A little scrambled. Okay, okay good. Yeah, I ch changed the yeah. network. Yeah. Um, okay. I've, re I've really got to upgrade my network here. So, um, yeah, what, what basically, long story short, uh, there's a lot of stuff that China does like that, that they don't really fully explain the story. And I don't know if it's just because they don't really have the capability to do it well. They don't know how to do it well. But all these facts are going to be laid out for people to go back and see for themselves that, oh, okay. All right. When they're ready to look at it objectively, that time isn't now. I do. I do have a complaint about Chinese state media because they, they do receive billions of dollars of funding and they could easily do a better job at explaining China's China's uh, position because that's that's their job. Their job is to explain China's tell China's story to the world. And and I have to say they haven't do, done a good job. I mean, granted that they're facing a lot of headwind because, you know, the U.S. have kind of cultural hegemony and, and and the dominance of Anglo in the especially in the Anglo media. But still, you know, I, I when people have to reach out to me on Twitter to explain what what's you know something that China did, that tells me the Chinese state, this is a job that China, Chinese state media should be doing. <laughs> Not people shouldn't have to reach out to some random internet random like myself to explain what's right. what the hell kick is going on. You know, they, they, they're, they're really terrible. I, I mean, well, you know, there is an element that they're on the defensive, right? They have all of these attacks that they need to address. And sometimes it seems like they're trying too hard. And now I have, I have a friend in, uh, well, I have many friends in Tibet. And one of them in particular doesn't like the government. And the things that he doesn't like the government isn't the level of stuff that they're talking about in the West. Same for Xinjiang. I have Uyghur friends. I have Kazakh friends in Xinjiang. And they've got issues with the government. They've got things they don't like. And they also have things about the uh, anti-terrorism program that they really didn't like. But again, it's not the level that the Western media is blowing it up to be. And the problem with Chinese media is if you're going to just do a story on how everything is perfect, nothing is wrong. We didn't make any missteps when we were doing this. And every time you go to Xinjiang, there's, it's going to be like you're walking into a Bollywood movie where everybody's dancing. And then you've got the other side of the story, which is the West saying it's a genocide. It's the, you know, it's the worst thing since Nazi Germany and all of this stuff. That's really difficult to believe, too. But when you're faced with only those two options, that everything is perfect and there's Nazi Germany level atrocities going on. Well, there's no such place in the world that is perfect. And there's definitely no such place in the world that could ever address a terrorism issue perfectly. So you're going to believe this side. If the Chinese media was just honest and saying, listen, we, we screwed up in a few places here. It's nothing like what you're talking about. But they gave everybody a middle ground option. That is going to be a lot easier to believe than both sides, but they don't do that. And, and, and they should have, they should have just taken that Deng Xiaoping's uh, evaluation of a cultural revolution, right? Like, oh no, not a cultural revolution. Sorry, Deng Xiaoping's evaluation of Mao: thirty percent bad, seventy percent good. If they just applied that guideline, this this thirty yeah. percent, seventy percent guideline in the reported China, they would have gain far more credibility. That's just, just yeah. all I'm saying. And, and, and it will be closer to the truth also. And that's why when, when, some, when, when people were talking to me, like my critics and stuff like that, and they were trying to attack me, they're saying, I believe everything Chinese media says. I say, no, I don't. I don't believe everything China media says, but I just feel like the truth is closer to their version of the story. And that's based on my own kind of investigations and talking to people, knowing people on the ground. But for sure, um, let's... Uh, keep going before this ends up being a three hour video again. <laughs> the ADIZ zone was created by the US actually and is not internationally recognized as actual airspace. And the point of this drawn zone is to allow countries the right to monitor all aircraft in the area to catch unwanted threats that may head toward the country. And with Taiwan's ADIZ encompassing much of mainland China itself, they could claim hundreds of flights are in their air zone each day. But you can see from this map that China has not entered Taiwan's actual airspace. 
Now, once again, China is an economic competitor. They are not thoughtless, and they definitely are doing things to try to undercut and weaken us through IP theft and currency manipulation. And we need to aggressively counter China, but we need to be smarter about it and counter through competition, not through debilitation. They are playing a strategic game of go while we're playing a guessing game of battleship. It's only going to result in us spending gobs of money, making the military industrial complex wealthier, while we, the American people, are told we can't use our tax dollars for things like universal pre-K, health care, or college because we can't afford it. Well, we can afford it if we stop these endless warmongering. We just ended one war weeks ago. The last thing we need to do is ramp up a cold war with a behemoth that ends up costing us many times Daniel, more. Did you... But the media, the war hawks, and the war lobby are... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I thought you just cut- froze. I thought you, you. I thought you. You were. I thought your connection just cut out because you, you were frozen. Oh, could the, you still hear the video though? N- now, no, yeah, you're not, now you're not frozen. You're just being really still. I think. <laughs> okay, but you, but you heard you heard the entire yeah. video, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I just want to say, yeah. you know, a, a lot of these things, and I, I actually don't mind when they. When they talk about IP theft and things like that, when actually you see that China's innovating, they're coming out with 5G first, they're coming out with these TikTok programs and stuff like that. I don't mind when people like Kim regurgitate some of these talking points because it's like it's too much for somebody to hear that, OK, everything you know about China is false. It's almost like you have to, you know, you know, extend an olive branch. And somebody sent me, um, there's these famous, uh, what are they called from Australia? The real government ads. They did a, they usually do (laughs) these comedy sketches. Yeah. 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 The juice media. Yeah. 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 And so they did one on, um, on uh, China and this cold war against China. And they basically said, uh, they, they, they framed it in a way that all the things we hear about Xinjiang is true. And, but then they said, and the, and us wanting to do something about it is so ridiculous and hypocritical for these reasons. And I had a lot of my fans reach out to me saying they really have an issue with this video. Can you reach out to them? Can you debunk it or something? And I just said to them, I said, you know what? I actually don't mind. I think that's fine. You know, I think you almost uh, that's a valuable additional viewpoint that you can say, even if you want to believe all of the claims at face value, the things that you're saying, the way that you're virtue signaling. And the, the, what you want to do is still ridiculous, even if you want to believe everything that's being said. So that, um, that's a very good point, because I, I maybe the same people also reach out to me and want me to do a, a reaction video to the juice media. And I I didn't respond to them. But in my mind, I was thinking exactly the same thing. I'm like, no, the juice yeah. media is making a very good point to reach out to these Australians who otherwise have been brainwashed about bad, bad China, but about thinking what Australian government itself is doing, you know, whether it's worth it or or whether it's, you know, it's real, how it's really hypocritical for Australia to, to get, to get involved and to intervene in China. You know, I'm, I'm just happy if they could convince part, some part of their Australian uh, viewership that, it's it's totally ridiculous what Australia is doing. Get getting a, a new get into this new cold war with China. I will I will be happy with that. You know I don't have to convince them everything about you know how Xinjiang is actually happening. Yeah yeah absolutely. And I mean uh, it, it 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 reminds them that they've got a lot of crap that they can fix at home first, and they're in a supposed superior democracy, you know, liberal Western liberal democracy where you're supposed to be able to affect change in the government. So that, why don't you stop? Yeah. Well, why don't you stop your Australian SAS soldiers from murdering Muslims face down in their fields while they're holding their prayer beads? Why don't you stop them from continually fighting wars based on lies? It's like, particularly uh, even your dogs agreeing with me, if you can hear that. <laughs> That's my dogs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, particularly when you want to say that you think China should adopt systems like Australia has. Well, show us, show us that you can stop committing these levels of atrocities and then come over and try to change China, even if you really want to believe that China, what China is doing is true. And if you come to them from from our approach where you say 90 percent of what you believe about China is false, then um a lot of people, you're going to lose a lot of people immediately. They're just not ready to hear that. With Juice Media, if they say 50% of 
what you're hearing or the way you're thinking about this is wrong, but even still then there's a big issue here. That's still a very valuable perspective that could affect change in groups of people that we wouldn't be able to by going the full mile and saying, no, guys, actually 90 percent is false. Yeah, the, the juice media could be the gateway drugs, guys. They, they just let open their mind a little bit. <laughs> eventually, they will. They, eventually, they will come to us. <laughs> That's a very good way to put it. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you want? Do you have anything to add, Brian? Before I continue? Oh no, I'm. I'm no, I'm good. Okay, you guys cool. were covering All right, everything. Good. All right. Already go. greasing the wheels for more war while manipulating us into going along with it. Curious your take on this, uh, both Emily and Ryan. What are you thinking about this, this ramped really up good rhetoric starts. with China? Curious, Emily, do you think China is an actual? Look at that. Look you at that already face on Emily. At their face. Look, at, look at their faces. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> what? What did you just do? Look at those faces. How dare you? Kim Kim has no idea what's coming. <laughs> oh, you know, foe that we need to maybe flex our military muscles against. Well, so flexing our military muscles, I guess, is a different question. And that's kind of exactly what my response is. And that two things can be true at the same time. It, it is true that the military industrial complex can be using um, the, the disgusting human rights abuses that the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government is committing um, for their own ends because they're hawkish and they're hungry. And I think you do see that absolutely in the rhetoric surrounding Taiwan. That is completely true. I think it is also true that China is provoking um, countries that are defenders um, of, of freedom, and um, there's no, I think, there's no equivocation. There, there's no equivalence between what China is doing, which is ethnic cleansing of Uyghur Muslims. Uh <laughs> okay, hold on. You see, right? Look, <laughs> first of you all, Ryan, like, Ryan, where did she get off? Where, yeah, where did she get off saying any of that? They're claiming that China didn't, didn't kill a million Uyghurs. They just locked them up. This is what they're claiming. So even in their most fevered dreams or, or nightmares, China is locking up a million Uyghurs. They killed a million people in, in Iraq. The U.S., the U.K., Australia, they all helped. They all helped the U.S. They lied about everything going on in Iraq so that they could do that. And the country 20 years later is still ruined and, and still trying to put itself together. And she's going to, to actually sit there and say, no, this time, yeah, yeah, the military industrial but, but complex. Brian, is, this Brian, is but Brian, the, those are the countries that are defending freedoms, Brian. Exactly. You know, exactly. China is provoking them. It's, you know, it's, exactly. it's, it's really provocative. Well, there was a, to, yeah, there was a contradiction, too. She's like. You know, the U.S. is hawkish and, you know, this warmongering. We don't have to, you know, but they're also the defenders of freedom. No, no, no. OK, hold on a second. Which is it? And then also you're saying that, yes, we can accept that the U.S. is hawkish and pro-war or whatever it is that she was saying. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't believe the narratives that this hawkish pro-war regime or uh, government is pushing to us. You know, it doesn't mean we shouldn't, but like, it, it, it just it completely contradicts you, you can't, itself. You can't say regime, Daniel. You can't see, say yeah. U.S. regime. I give you the I, pass. <laughs> I, want, I want to use it. I mean, a lot of people say I'll lose people when I say that, but really it is what it is. There's a permanent war state in the U.S. Uh, and an, uh, an apparatus that, that it, absolutely it's a regime. But you can see, look at Ryan Grimm, man. He's fuming. He's waiting to go. He's, He's waiting for the waiting. tag in. He's waiting to go. <laughs> tag me in. <laughs> All right, let's um, go. And that is, I mean, BuzzFeed News has incredible reporting on that. We've interviewed uh, people who have come out of the, the camps in Xinjiang. Uh, this is, it is ethnic cleansing. There are reports of... Like Tersene, like Tersene Zioaden, who had got her passport renewed while she was in the concentration camps, left legally through uh, exit immigrations, had a story on BuzzFeed where she said, you know what? I was detained and it wasn't that bad. We had our food. I had my cell phone I could use. And then when she got on the BBC and CNN, it turned into this, you know, uh, rape and torture and all of this stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Those are the kinds of witnesses that were on BuzzFeed. Even but after that, she the, got her uh, U.S. Uh, asylum. Uh, right after right. Her, her testimonial got upgraded, she she also got upgraded treatment. She she now she she right. lands a a nicey, comfy, uh, cushy place in U.S. Yeah, and they're and drawing portraits of her on the side of buildings in the U.K. now. I, I saw that. Uh, and even during the tribunal, the Uyghur tribunal, they brought in all of these witnesses that she's talking about. By the way, a, a witness account is not 
is not solid evidence. That is a starting point to go look for solid evidence. And so you could already see that they're doing the exact same thing that they did in all of these other wars where we now know in retrospect they were lying. They're doing the exact same thing. There's no physical evidence of any of this. And the Uyghur tribunal isn't even a case of someone changing their story from you know two years ago to today. They provided a written statement. And then when they were in front of the panel, they gave a totally different story. So one lady in her written statement said she was uh, she was interrogated all night and then she was like, oh, that's what it said in the written statement. And then in front of the panel, she said she was thrown down a 20 meter well, hosed with water and electrocuted for 24 hours. How do you go from that written statement to that spoken statement unless you're lying? How, how, how could both stories be true? Or, or you're being coached by somebody who's to tell you to spicy up the story a little bit, you know, make 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 a good story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, I think you're breaking up again, Dan. Okay, you, you guys continue talking as I'm fixing my connection. Okay. Okay. I, I, I just want to throw in one more uh, one more thing about these witnesses. If you look into their background, they and, and you just listen to them talk, they're going to call Xinjiang East Turkestan because they're separatists. They're separatists, they supported the violence and the terrorism. Their separatist movement was crushed, and now they have a, a chip on their shoulder against Beijing. And now they're going to be telling any story they can to get back, get back because of their Sorry. failed political project, which which was sponsored by the U.S. government the entire time. And this is another. Uh, just if I could share my screen, like one, just one second. I, I won't get into the NED, the U.S. government's uh, political interference funding arm. This is their official website. And they call it Xinjiang, East Turkestan. And East Turkestan is what the separatists call Xinjiang. And they claim that it's occupied by China. And if you if you go to the World Uyghur Congress funded by the US government, who organized the Uyghur tribunal that all of these witnesses she was just talking about. If you scroll down, it even says down here, the, an opposition movement against Chinese o occupation of East Turkestan. This, the US government is funding an organization that has separatist ambitions uh, to to violate the territorial integrity of China in violation of the UN Charter. So they'll never Absolutely. talk about that because the whole the whole thing will be exposed. Yeah, yeah, no, and it, that's why it was really interesting to see her bring out all of these facts that you never see in mainstream media. And this is why that's you're getting this really uncomfortable reaction. And and you know, talking about trusting uh, testimonials, you know, I remember the. The famous gay girl in Damascus during Syrian war, right? I mean, we're supposed to believe that too. And it turns out that was a character created by American Tom McMaster. <laughs> the, the, but that that fact only came out several years later, you know, when, when you, you, you no longer matter. But the, again, we're being told this time is different, right? Like we, we have testimonial, we're supposed to, you know, I believe the testimonial of Lara, Naraya during the first Gulf War, that that time is because I was only 13 year old. The first time coming to United States, first time into contact with a awesome power, American propaganda, right? And and so I give myself a pass on that. Uh, but fool me once, right? Shame on you. Fool me twice. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, can you still hear me? Okay, on your side. Yeah. Yes. Now you're clear. I've, okay, good. I've got I've got some new uh, internet connection stuff coming, so I'm going to be good better in the future. But let me see if this if this shows up. Is are you yes. seeing an image yeah, we, on the screen? Yeah, yes, we oh, see, see that. the okay, image of Naraya. Yes. So yeah, for people yeah, yeah. who don't don't know, who are too uh, not old enough to remember, Naraya is a girl who uh, testified in front of Congress to tell a sobbing story how, about how Iraqi soldiers were ripping babies from incubators and 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 killing them and this is a, this is like the, the the kind of story that's designed to tug your heartstrings you know we yeah. have to do something this is a humanitarian intervention and it turns out later it turns out she was uh, not just some anonymous girl she was actually the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador and right. <laughs> yeah yep uh, and so that if you saw, it didn't show up on my screen, the image, but if you saw on the right side, that was Tersene Ziwadan, the one who has the boga story that keeps changing. And so the artist who, who, who painted a massive 
a portrait of her on the side of a building, I said that she should have put her hand on the other side of her face uh, because then it would have resembled uh, the Nyira testimony because it's exactly what it is. It's the same kind of a thing. Um, so let's um, continue on here. There are people who say they have endured forced sterilization. This is a, a, a grave human rights abuse on a scale that is far greater than uh, problems with our own prisons, which do exist. Um, and so I think two things can be true. And so I absolutely agree with that instinct for nuance. And I do think that hawks are exploiting um, some of that to, am to ramp up, uh, you know, per perhaps our, to whet our appetites with a, for a military conflict with China 100 yeah. percent. And I think what's happening in Xinjiang is maybe easier to be understood as a, as a cultural genocide. There, there's a real effort to just completely you know, wipe away the, the culture that has been there for, for hundreds of years. And I don't think it's... You know, nobody ever clarifies this. I've asked people this. It's like, well, what part of their culture is being eradicated? And what they're doing is they're just regurgitating uh, talking points. They don't actually understand what it is. I mean, some of them say language, and then you can really say, well, does that really make sense? And you can give them all <laughs> kinds of hard evidence that that's not what's happening. But that's just a talking point that's being regurgitated. Uh, and it's talking about the language, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 I was going to save this for later, but a couple of days after this show came out, the AP actually came out that article uh, uh, AP journalist uh, uh, visited Xinjiang and they started to walk back from the genocide narrative and they say, oh, uh, now you you already mentioned that Uyghur teenage boys are seen again on the street flirting with girls and you can hear the, 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 the people talk, speaking in the Uyghur language, right? But there's still fear. The fear still remain, right? And, it's, and it's invisible. It's unheard. It's <laughs> unspoken. It's just beneath the surface. Conveniently, you know, you know interesting? leaving no trace yeah. of evidence. You know, what was interesting, too, is they really wanted to emphasize the alcohol point, too, saying that they're drinking now. And it's like, well, ho hold on a second. Uyghurs have been drinking for thousands of years. They've been making their own wine. Like, this is part of their culture. And um, so so they're still trying to... And, and there's, there's, a, there's a geopolitical advantage to do that as well. Because a lot of the Muslims, the the, the more kind of the, the Salaf, not I'll say I'll say not Muslim Salafist jihadists, they're very different. Um, this is the thing that I really want to be careful about because the people conflate ordinary Muslims with what was being what what was the actual issue here. So Salafist jihadists who were being recruited around the world to liberate the Uyghurs, it was really to create um, a caliphate and have them rule. With Sharia law and alcohol would absolutely 100 percent be banned. So introducing that part into the story, reminding those Muslims who were radicalized to believe they need to help fight for the Uyghurs, that Uyghurs are drinking now, that will actually help enrage people. I don't know if you guys remember the interview I did with uh, my friend who, who used to be associated with uh, with Al Qaeda. Um, he was talking about these being essential parts of the propaganda mechanism also um, to, to to get kind of a radicals on board. Yeah, but, the, the, um, the, 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 the AP article actually spent a great deal talking about the drinking problem. And, and there's a whole section on this uh, sp a drunken Uyghur man, uh, you know, uh, behind him, a drunk Uyghur man was yelling, alcohol is forbidden for practicing Muslim, especially in the holy month of Ramadan. First of all, he didn't even go on the month of Ramadan, he, but he, for some reason, he just he have to insert it there. Um, right. uh, and then, then he said, I, I, the, the, he's quoting the Uyghur man, I have been drinking alcohol, I'm a little drunk, but that's no problem. We can drink as we want now, he shouted. We can do what we want. Things are great now. And uh, and then at a nearby store, I noticed liquor bottles lining the shelves. In another town, my colleague and I encountered drunken Uyghur men pass out by a trash bin in broad daylight. This, though many Uyghurs in big cities like Urumqi have long indulged in drinking, such sites were once unimaginable in the pious rural area of southern Xinjiang. Uh, the, he... What he doesn't say is what would happen few years ago if that Uyghur man had been caught drinking. Oh, that, yeah. that, you know, like what would happen? 
that's the kind of thing that in the Western media they will castigate the Taliban for. It's like, oh my God, you know, Taliban ban drinking, the ban women, yep. um, uh, the the ban dancing, the the, the ban music, the ban women from from uh, from going out of the houses and then forcing them to wear wear the niqab. Those are happening in rural Xinjiang in the in the in the decades that's leading up to to the Chinese uh, security response. That that's it, it, what. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, I was just going to say exactly because they say the the pi, you know, back then when it used to be really pious, but they don't talk about how even before that it wasn't that pious and that the real cultural genocide was when Saudi Arabia, encouraged by the United States, was exporting Salafism, this politically motivated uh, perversion of Islam, and they were radicalizing these people. And they were actually at the time dividing the communities and I show people this this article that I got on the screen here from the Los Angeles Times it's from 2016 in China rise of Salafism fosters suspicion and division amongst Muslims because it started up uh, among the Muslims it didn't it didn't start with people in in Xinjiang fighting against the, the government in Beijing it was actually these radicals fighting with with each with the other muslims the the traditional uyghur muslims and the way they had practiced for generations and so that was actually the real cultural genocide and china just reversed it and now we have this ap reporter this is actually uh the article here and they're like they're acting as if all of this freedom now that these people have to decide whether they want to be muslim or secular like this is some um imposition imposed by Beijing on on Xinjiang, and, and it's like they're complaining about that—that that people actually have a choice. And uh, <laughs> you know, the cultural genocide—you know, like th these must be holograms or something. I, I like—I don't know I, what what they are talking about. I mean, they're just following uh, the, the the time honored tradition uh, in 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 the West that uh, uh, it, you know all any kind of social changes. Should be left to the private sector. <laughs> like, like a government intervention is no no. That's authoritarianism. But if anything's to be done, it should be big companies, <laughs> big tech companies like Facebook right. and Google. <laughs> Those are the right. responsible actors. You know, Amazon. They they should should be the one that step in and change our our social our everyday behavior. Not the government. <laughs> yeah, you know the and the. the 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 amount of time that they spent on that on the alcohol part was extremely extremely suspicious and that's when you you there's reason to believe that they are um built into these mechanisms that want to utilize terrorism against china i mean they didn't they didn't delist etim the terrorist organization for no reason they said that oh it's because they don't exist anymore like they were literally bombing them the us was bombing etim you know 2 or 3 years ago and if they say that they don't exist anymore, the Tamil Tigers haven't existed for a decade, but they're still on the terrorist list. So it's got nothing to do with that. And so when you've got a journalist that's focusing so much time and attention on the alcohol part, you've got to be really suspicious. And this is what I don't know if you remember. There was a guy from the UK, Sabur, who, who went after yes. me. I tried to have yes. a conversation with him and he kept yelling over me. I couldn't get anything out. And then he like took clips and then misrepresented what I said because I didn't get a chance to finish what I said. But the main thing he led on his article uh, about me was when I was like 24 years old or something like that, I had a blog that I even forgot about. Actually, these guys dug up a blog that I even forgot I wrote. And it was kind of cool because I was like, oh, I, I get to see what I used to write back then. It's like, thanks, guys. But the intro was like, hi, my name is Daniel and I'm an alcoholic. Oops, the wrong room. And so they took that as literal. Like they didn't look at it as a joke. Like they didn't look at it as the Alcoholics Anonymous joke. Like that's what everybody says in the movies and Alcoholics Anonymous. So, you're breaking up but take your time i want to hear that alcohol story alcoholic <laughs> story that sounds like interesting as you guys are drinking right now and i drink my juice i'm i'm the only pious one here you could be our sponsor you could be our sponsor when we go to our meetings uh if and uh while we wait for daniel uh yeah, you guys pre sound first. okay well you're clear now oh well, wait now you so sound a little bit clear can you talk again yeah. uh, daniel okay uh testing i uh, testing about that's okay good. now that's good okay. You're fine. okay good 
All right, all right. I'm, I'm promise I'm getting my internet stuff sorted out. It's been okay. way too long. What what part what part did I get up to that was clear? Uh, you're, 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 I am Daniel. I'm an alcoholic. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, 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 so they looked at my yeah yeah they looked at my blog at my from when I was twenty something years old, and they took it literally, and they uh they didn't understand that it was an alcoholics. No, I think they did understand that it was an alcoholics anonymous joke. I mean, it's enough in pop culture that they should have understood that. They're, that that particular guy is from the West. Also, he was born in the West. But it was really important for him to sell that story to his followers, a lot of them who are extremists, like he's connected to and he's talking to people like Arslan, who are who are admitted extremists, who say that they don't they want to ethnically cleanse Xinjiang after they take it over of all non uh, uh, Turkic ethnic minorities, as he puts it. So that was really, really an essential part to emphasize the alcohol part. And so I didn't mind that he believed that I was an alcoholic for a number of reasons. Well, first of all, I mean, I know other people who were alcoholics and they recovered from that. And it's like, so what? It's like, good. They, 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 they got over that. Like, I mean, it, it, that's a weird thing to go, go after. Um, but also he was making a fool of himself out of in front of everybody else who read that line and recognized it as a, as a, a, a joke. But also if he wants to paint me as this alcoholic high school dropout as he was, and he can't refute any of my arguments. That should be an even bigger humiliation for him. But on to the main point, he really deliberately tried to emphasize that. And that's what happened in this article also. It was almost an, a natural amount of airtime that was given to that alcohol point. And I really, really believe that was a highly strategic intelligence community level thing. You're breaking up again. Anytime you talk about your intelligence, scramble your audio output. <laughs> sound like you are in the witness protection program. Sounds like sounds like you're getting ready to do testimony in front of the legal tribunal. <laughs> okay, now you're, you're clear. okay now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, I was going to say, I, I know it sounds like a, a conspiracy theory level thing, but it really was a, an awkwardly unnatural amount of airtime that was dedicated towards that piece about alcohol. And it ties into um, getting the attention of radicals who say, OK, these are Muslims that need to be saved. Now they're being subjected to alcohol and all this kind of stuff. Very, very strategic. It's, 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 um, if you guys, it's, that's yeah, that's right. that's possible. But the other thing that I think they were trying to do was just to to pretend that Beijing's policy disfigured Xinjiang from its natural uh, indigenous state, when in reality they were uprooting something that was actually imposed unnaturally on Xinjiang by Saudi Arabia with America's blessing. And they don't, they're not explaining that. And they just hope that their audience is, is ignorant to that, to the true nature of these extremists and the fact that normal Muslims can hang out with people who drink and eat pork and not have a problem with that. As long as everyone res respects, lives and let lives, like here in Thailand, uh, that, that's totally normal. But if they're extremists, they cannot. And that's what was happening in Xinjiang. And it was, it was being imposed on, on the region from outside uh, by Saudi sponsored extremism. And, and the, they're not, the way, they never and talked the, about that. And the way it infiltrated into Xinjiang was via Afghanistan. It's when the when the Uyghur Mujahid, Mujahideens who participated in the well, Afghan, in Afghanistan war, who returned back to Xinjiang, who brought back those, those uh, Salafist ideas into Xinjiang, uh, they started to imposing their ideas on the rural society. Now, U.S. media talk great deal about Taliban, how Taliban is, you know, imposing their strict version of Islam on Afghanistan, right? But when it comes to Xinjiang, they certainly treat it as this kind of natural, organic, traditional version of Islam that's been practicing in Xinjiang before the communists come over, right? Which is when it's totally come from the same root. You know, uh, I, I I know Taliban is supposed to be the Diobandi version. You know, not the not the the, the Saudi version, but but they're pretty very. We're talking about like the, the very strict interpretation of Islam here, and 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 the the Xinjiang and the the, the Muj, they they literally come from the same root. The the, the Xinjiang Mujahideens are the returning Uyghur Mujahideens from Afghanistan. So you you see U.S. when media talk about Afghanistan, it's like. Oh, we need to save the women 
We need to save the girls from you know being able to go to school. That's why we got to send back our military to prevent the Taliban takeover, right? When on on the on the side of Xinjiang, when, when the Chinese government is taking the measures to make sure the women can get out of the house to 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 participate in the society, no, that's Chinese Chinese government is forcibly breaking down the traditional Uyghur society, right? Yeah. Absolutely. What happened? I'm just. What happened to your internet, man? You you have you have you are in you are in Shenzhen, China. You have worse internet than Bali. How how does that happen? Okay, okay you're back. Yeah, you're no. Back. Uh, the 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 problem is is I'm this room that I set my studio up in is actually a storage room. It's not meant to be an actual room. So I ran my own internet through the coaxial cable. I used mm -hmm. one of those devices to run it through yeah. a coaxial cable, and it's, I'm having tons of issues. So I'm mm. getting one of those 5G uh, portable hotspots. So I promise everybody I'll have this fixed out. But what I want okay. to say to add on to your story, um, if the U.S. was successful in stabilizing Afghanistan and they had these women and all these people who could wear what they want, they could drink what they want. It would be a story of success saying, look, these people can now do whatever they want. They can wear what they want. They can drink what they want. If they want to get drunk in the street, they can get drunk in the street. And it would be a celebratory thing. But yes. They've got they've got an agenda in Xinjiang. So it's like, oh, my God, I met a drunk Uyghur. That is that 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 isn't that is that's outrageous absolutely wrong it's and, outrageous and, and he punctuates almost every sentence with a han cadre hovering over them watching everything <laughs> like like they <laughs> produce the drunk guy or i like like everything is being staged by these mysterious han chinese cadres yeah following yeah I, and I, i'm almost question i mean in my mind i'm actually almost questioning like how do you know that's a Han cadre? Because he clearly said in the article the quote unquote Han cadre spoke to the old man in Uyghur. So I'm like, okay, so he speaks Uyghur, right? I mean, he speaks the language. So how do you know, you know, a, a Associated Press reporter, you know, who who is not Chinese, by the way, he who is not a ethnic Chinese, uh, you know, uh, 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 he, so how would you know who is Han, yeah. who is Uyghur? You know when. I, I, I'm assuming the AP as, uh, as a reporter has some knowledge of standard Mandarin, right? So he knew. That's why he knew the the cadre was speaking Uyghur to to the to the guy. Then, then how do you, how do you know who is the Han, who is the Uyghur here? How you know you you yeah. you're kind of physical and, and, and you, anthropologist here? You know, did you bring your did you bring your scout? Uh, you know, your 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 your, your scout calipers to. <laughs> to, 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 to <laughs> yeah, seriously. In some that's in the field phonology. <laughs> That's that's like a that's like a, a tip off to the to the, the the Nazi teams that went through Tibet doing those things. I don't know if you know about those stories. Yep, they yep, went through yep, measuring yep. the Tibetan skulls and everything like that. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it, it, seriously. I mean, and, and if you look at um, you know, so every all the Uyghur girls they call themselves Guli, and there was one that was on YouTube, and she was clearly Uyghur. I mean, her first language is Uyghur, and everybody went after her because she looked too Han Chinese. So. I mean, it's like these people can make this mistake. That's for sure. Um, let's uh, let's continue on then and see what we've got here. Or did you did you have something you wanted to uh, add in, Brian? Or uh, no, I'm just getting it ready for Ryan. Okay, Gray. cool, cool, cool. <laughs> okay, let's let's we Version want the Brian Ryan. Of a, of a <laughs> we Mujahideen. want Hadin, and I and I and I and I kind of object to this this idea that exists a lot on online that if you criticize. China or anything that the Chinese government has done, then you are necessarily, uh, you know, calling for war or you are supporting the war effort. It's not only do I think that there's no logical connection between those two things, I actually think it's a little bit naive because underlying it is the assumption that if you don't participate in these criticisms of uh, cultural genocide going on among the Uyghur population, then the war hawks won't wage war on China. Mm. But that's absurd. Like there are there are structural forces and there are entire industries that are pushing in that direction, completely regardless of whether or not you voice you know accurate criticisms of what the Chinese government is doing. And that, that, there's something really important to say here. There are these industries that are pushing, regardless if you believe in the narrative or not that these very industries he's talking about is pushing. 
it's these industries, it's these military industrial complexes exactly. that are funding Aspie to put these reports out about forced labor, Uyghur genocide and things like that. So there absolutely exactly. is a connection and you absolutely have to ask what is their interest to push this story? And, and you, you absolutely you. have to, yeah, yes, and you absolutely have to require a higher threshold of evidence to believe this kind of stuff, especially when the U.S. State Department is funding it, based on what we've learned from history. And 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 you listen to what he's really said here. He's saying, you know, these are these are structural forces pushing for war with China. There's nothing you can do, you little ordinary Americans. You mean nothing. You, there's no way you can change the U.S. policy. U.S. will go to war how it wants. You have no say in this. Like this is again, you know, they're still talking about U.S. as the freedom loving, freedom defend, defending nation Worst. here. Yeah. Worse is that I bet you this guy is the kind of guy who says, I think China should adopt our system while also on the side admitting it's a system. Or am, I, or am I am I breaking out again? You're breaking up again. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, while while you're trying to figure out your network, let me let me have my two cents in. Um, so what what Ryan is saying is that as ordinary Americans or or any citizens of these so-called Western liberal democracy, there's no way you can change the foreign policy. You know the push for war, but but you can raise your voice to criticize China because. Really, you know, you can't change the U.S. government policy, but somehow you can magically affect Chinese government through your voice of your criticisms. This is completely idiotic, right? I mean, like, and right. you you are actually supposed to be able to, through democracy, to change your own government's uh, actions. Right. You have zero. Ryan has I, I'm going to say this. Ryan has zero effect on Ch whatever Chinese government is going to do. Right. But supposedly we have the power to change our government, to change our government policy. Right. But Ryan is like, no, 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 you, you, you can't do that. There's structural forces too great for you to 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 uh, do to deal with. You know, no, no, focus, focus on your criticism on China, because really you could actually change affect what Chinese government is doing. Look, 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 look at the, the look at the other ladies. Well, yeah, look sorry, at the other ahead. ladies. Look at the other lady's face, though. She's like, I just said that they were heroes for freedom and human rights. What are you doing? <laughs> look at her face. Like, what are you? Why are you saying that? <laughs> they they actually they actually had a, a, another segment where Ryan actually I started following him before because he just went through all of the issues with America. And she had the same look on her face. She's like, yeah, but but and he's like, no, 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 no. We don't do things for really for human rights and stuff like that. And he actually had a really good segment criticizing the U.S. But the, the, the bigger offense here, the bigger issue is that people like Ryan think that these you know, so-called dictatorships like China should adopt American systems, you know, Amer Western liberal democracies, which he's admit admitting can go off and cause atrocities around the world, which you can do nothing about. They can wage wars and you can do nothing about it. So do they really want to? Do they really want China, a country that hasn't been going around the world waging wars so far, something that's working so far to keep China just focusing on itself more or less? And, you know, maybe somebody could argue making some provocations in the South China Sea if you want to be really liberal with their arguments and say that let's give them our system, which is absolute chaos and see if it works out better. It, 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 it's you are you are breaking up again. So let me let me take this time to put in my pitch to our audience. If you are a U.S. citizen, if you are a citizens of you know of any NATO country of the AUKUS alliance, you supposedly have the right to affect your own government's action through the practice of democracy by the principle upon which your country is founded. You, on the other hand, you have almost zero input on the Chinese government policy. So it only makes sense that you concentrate on your own efforts on changing your own government's policies and make them for the better. You know, that's the best use of your time and your energy and, you know, regardless what China is doing, on the other hand, because you cannot affect what, what China is doing, you, you, 
just just completely opposite of what Ryan is saying. <laughs> Ryan is full full. Can I can I swear on this? I don't know what's Daniel's policy on swearing on his podcast, but 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 Ryan is full shit. <laughs> just do opposite of what he says. Okay, and, uh, and- I. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, Ryan, Ryan. Da- Daniel was making a really good point before he started breaking up about he's talking about these structural forces seeking war with China. And how do you think that they're doing that? How do you think they're selling that to the public? They're selling it to the public by making up stories about Uyghur genocide, uh, China bullying Taiwan, even though the U.S. Uh, official position is that Taiwan is part of China. Uh, and so he is saying that we should believe these stories and we should be speaking out about these stories. Where are the stories coming from? And Daniel was talking about Aspie. These are where these reports are coming from. Andre- Adrian Zenz is part of an organization funded by the U.S. government based in Washington, D.C., squeezing out this, this war propaganda constantly, and he's gobbling it up. And then he's saying, oh, there's these structural forces leading us all all to war. I mean, doesn't he hear how, how that sounds when he's saying that, how little sense it makes? Right. I think one of the most important points I wanted to make also aside from that was that these are the same people who want China to change to a system like what America has. So China, a country that is not waging wars globally, changing to a system that Ryan admits is complete chaos that people have no control over when they continually choose to wage wars overseas. That doesn't sound like a smart idea, but you know, uh, both of those points together are pretty important. Let's, um, let's keep going here. Again, I, I, apologies for my connection. I'm gonna get that sorted out soon. I think uh, Emily said it well, that both things can be true at once. And so, you know, I, and I don't think we should shrink from our ob- obligation you know, to, be, to be critical of human rights abuses that are happening anywhere on, on the globe. Well, interestingly, every Muslim country, minus Turkey, I believe, actually is in alignment with China. I don't want to hear from the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia on human rights. I just don't care what they have to say about human rights. No, but I mean, regarding whether or not there's an actual... This, this, he, he knew what he was doing. He specifically called out Saudi Arabia, UAE. Okay, okay, how, how can you argue with that, right? But notice he used that as example when, when, uh, when Kim specifically said all Muslim countries, right? So right. what about Indonesia? What about Malaysia? What about what about you know a- any other you know uh, uh, Iraq? You know Iran, uh, 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 Morocco, right? But but he just dismisses all oh, these like Saudi Arabia, UAE, and 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 what he really wants to dismiss is that. All these Muslim countries, they, their opinions don't come because they're all they're not do not match our standard of liberal democracy, right? That's what he's really saying. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, this is actually. Can you guys still hear me clearly? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Now. So, so this is what he also because when I posted, I posted a couple of excerpts from this, and this part was one of it. And he actually responded to me. He actually, well, he retweeted it. And he said, um, okay, do you guys see that on the screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. I, I don't know what's going on with my connection. So, yeah. Um, can you read it? Because I can't I can't see it on my screen. What did he I say? I mean, no. Yeah. I mean, no. I don't actually want to hear from Saudi Arabia or UAE on human rights, right? Which is just regurgitating what he said on the show. And, yeah. and again, uh, Kim specifically said... All Muslim countries, maybe with the exception right. of Turkey, and he just had to have to single out the worst, <laughs> the worst examples of the Gulf Arab countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE, and and to negate the opinions of all the Muslim countries, because all yep. of them, he just write them off like, oh, I'm sorry, none of you match the standard of liberal democracy. I am, you know holding as a ruler uh, and you sorry so your opinion doesn't count and again this is a, the liberal democracy that he himself admitted that you know <laughs> you will go on rampage across the world an unstoppable of- war machine <laughs> exactly exactly yeah, they don't match no, our absolutely. standards as an unstoppable war machine yeah he which is true um, he, yeah can you guys still hear me okay 
and 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 he also said we need to you know we need cannot give up our moral obligations like who are we here you know like like who is he speaking for and what kind of moral obligation like you you have a moral obligation to speak up on the atrocities of your own countries because supposedly you you have the the the, the ability to change to change the policies of your country. But he already told us, no, you can't change that. You know, it's, it's structural forces. It's unstoppable. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, just, I don't know, this guy. Yeah, absolutely. It's and I you. actually, I responded to that testing. Still not good? Not, not yet. Not yet. Okay, I, I just wanted to add back in the, you know, what Ryan is trying to pose is this is some kind of a independent voice from the left or the progressive that that's, that's, that's independent from the US government action, because you know, we can't do anything about the US government action. So we can sit here and criticize everybody equally. I mean, it, it sounds, it sounds reasonable on its surface, right? But what it really distract what Kim is talking about here because Kim is talking about, hey, right now there's a pending conflict between U.S. and China that's pushed by the war, war hawks. We need to sit back and re-exam all the rationales for, for a, a conflict with China. Maybe we, we need to step back from the brink. That is the, 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 the main point of Kim. What Ryan has done is very successfully derail and detract from from Kim's point and and to to switch to talk of attacking China's human rights records. Yep, and and also so he basically, I mean, he made a straw man there. Like he he exactly. just late named two countries. Um, if you guys can see that, uh, yep. the you know fifty, it's even more countries than this now. It's all of these countries that he absolutely erased. And there were other people who chimed in also from Human Rights Watch. And you guys know about uh, Human Rights Watch with uh, Sophie Sophie Williams. But they showed up also saying, yeah, these are author authoritarian governments and it's not really the view of the people. But they can actually reach out to regular ordinary Muslims in these countries and ask, why is it they empathize with China? And they've got very good reasons for it. I'm not going to get into it here. I have a whole episode on that uh, with the guy who I mentioned before uh, from Egypt. But... He erased all of these countries. So when I responded to him, I, uh, let me see if this shows up. This isn't showing up on my screen. I'm not sure if that's the right response. Um, uh, but I said, oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. So, yeah, I said, I correct. mean, no, you're, you're, you're the one who decided to arbitrarily erase the rest of the Muslim word from Kim's statement. Um, and it was deliberate. It was deliberate because he just doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want to hear anybody who's disagreeing with the countries who are the U.S.'s allies. He's aligning with the 20 something countries, far fewer countries who align with America's narrative after admitting that America is this war mongering nation that, you know, perpetual war machine that they can't do anything to stop. Uh, I, I mean, it, 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 it absolutely. <laughs> the, the guy, I've never heard him make sense. So. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> no surprise. Right, let's continue. Yeah, let's continue seeing what he's saying. Whether or not there's an actual ethnic cleansing going on against Muslims they, in they, China, they, they have their own uh, geo, they have their own geopolitical reasons, and and pointing to the idea that well, these people are Muslims and they say nothing bad is happening there is is just yeah. not a serious inquiry into what's actually happening when we can talk to people who escaped from it. Yeah, like, they've been. So again, the escapees with these ever changing stories, and I had. Um, one of my uh, son's teachers, uh, he was from uh, he was from America. Really nice guy. I really liked him. Uh, he, he was an international school teacher here in Shenzhen, and he believed the genocide narrative. And when I told him this, uh, I said, you know, there are, you know, there are 20 something countries that say, yeah, they believe China is doing this genocide. And they're like, he, I'm like, yeah, but there's 54 countries that are saying that, no, that's not what's happening. And they went and checked it out for themselves. And they say, you know, uh, it's not what the media is saying. And he said, yeah, well, you have to look into them and you have to see, what, do they have any vested interests? Like, they are they part of the Belt and Road Initiative? Do they have any, do you have to find out what's the conflict of interest? And I'm like, well, why aren't you asking what's the conflict of interest with the even fewer number of countries and seeing if they're strategically aligned with the U.S.? I said, you've got to be, you've got to be even if you want to say this. A, 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 you know, if you just want to go on this and he, he actually uh, admitted and I, I have a very good relationship with him. Uh, he's now 
uh, actually in Thailand, uh, teaching in Thailand, but uh, he conceded. He says, yeah, that, that, that is a valid point. But he still he, he bought into the narrative. He never went to Xinjiang himself. He probably should have while he was here. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything else to add before I continue. No, that's I'm, I'm OK. okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I guess there's separatists there. There is definitely a separatist movement. So you're going to get two sides of a story for sure. You're going to get people that absolutely want to break away from China. They want their own their their own place. Uh, and so I think that right now it's way too early for anybody to make any sort of claims. That I think it's way, too big... it's way too late. It's way too late. There was a set. There was there was a separatist you. movement, and it was you know and it was quite effectively smashed with you know incredibly brutal tactics and. The U.S. is still funding these separatist groups. Like, but when you say he, when he says way too late, he meant it's way too late to save those separatists. That's what he really <laughs> meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, yeah, they're they're literally the groups that the U.S. government is funding are still waving the East Turkestan flags, and even more so when the NED tweets out that they're supporting these Uyghur groups. The NED's own tweet includes a picture of China with Xinjiang carved out with the East Turkestan flag over top. And he's saying there's no more separatist movement. And I mean, they're, said they're all in proud. Washington making these and, statements. And NED's tweet said we're proud to be sponsoring, <laughs> to be yeah. funding the, the groups in Xinjiang for the for the last decade to the tune of how many million dollars they said they, they spent. Yeah. And if he was misspeaking and he was talking about terrorism and he if he was talking about Uyghurs who had been radicalized, literally hours after this show aired, a Uyghur suicide bomber blew himself up in northern Afghanistan in a mosque, killing a hundred people. I mean, that, that happened literally just a few hours after this aired. It, yeah. it, it, it's so so I, I don't know if he misspoken. He meant the terrorism problem. And of course, there are um, there are still plenty of people who escaped Xinjiang who are in Syria still fighting alongside Al Qaeda and, uh, and and their kids are training in ISIS camps. There's videos and footage of that. Um, I mean, it, it, no matter how you look at it, there's no way to interpret what he said as an honest piece of information. So let's. Uh, and that, there's nothing wrong with like just saying that. But that's Doesn't another mean we case. Need to go to war over it. Right. That's another case of both wow. things being true. Right. Like yeah. it, it can be true that there was a, a separatist movement that was then smashed by authoritarian, um, culturally genocidal, and wildly uh, abusive tactics by the CCP. Right, and you just thoroughly lose all your credibility if you deny it. That that's an important point. I don't I, I don't know if you want to take this one, Brian, but that's an obvious, really important point. Because because he's what he's doing is he's saying this is the story, and if you don't go along with it, you have no credibility, and we're not even going Absolutely. to open room for discussion or questioning it. You just have to accept it, and if you don't, you have no credibility which is not what an honest person who wants to know the truth and understand the problem to thus solve the problem. That's not what someone like that does. This is what a liar does when they're trying to convince you of a lie and they don't want any pushback. And this is exactly what he's doing. He's bullying her into accepting his position and to just shut up and stop debating. That's exactly what he's Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. And he's Absolutely. making he's making Adrian Zen's uh, Xinjiang narrative a religion here. It's like you can't question belief. This is our belief. You, you, it's right. offensive if you question our belief that there's indeed yeah. a genocide in Xinjiang. Yeah. You lose all legitimacy if you don't accept this narrative at face value. I mean, that's exactly what he's saying. It's just like I was, I was talking about those people who were saying that you uh, need to believe the survivors. I mean, it, it's just there's certain things you're not supposed to question. And if you have a, a, a government that is trying to exploit people's emotions or try to find excuses to ramp up aggressions. This is an open invitation to them saying, go into this category, say these things, and we have to take it at face value. We will lose all credibility if we don't. And they're exploiting that. You know, the, the, the propagandists are exploiting that. All right, let's continue. Like, I don't agree with that. I think it's the other way around, actually. But, okay. But, you know, that's, that's I, just, I guess one like, question is what scale of uh, what's on what scale do you think that the CCP is abusing uh, Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang? 
I'm sure that the scale, I'm, it, I'd say it's very similar to what we do here in the United States when it comes to Patriot Act and carting people off to Guantanamo Bay. Oh, I'm gosh, sure it's a but very- we don't put uh, an situation. entire people in camps based on their religious think, identity. I mean, I think, Guantanamo I Bay has, uh, there, Guantanamo at this point is dozens of people. Right, but you cannot make the claim the, by any stretch of any- So uh, there's, there's, I just want quick- yeah, go ahead. They're leaving out the fact that they have killed a million people in Iraq, right. tens yeah. of thousands or more in Afghanistan, hot, over a hundred thousand in Syria, uh, in Libya. They have destroyed the entire the entire country. It is not a functioning nation state, and their drone yeah. warfare stretches from North Africa to Central Asia. So you're right. You don't. You have dozens of people in camps because you prefer actually genociding them for yeah, for, like, for real. So this guy so you know dishonest. why you know why they present it that way because they want everybody to accept it as normalcy that US will do that US will just go around the world and kill millions of people and that just that's just part of US empire's daily maintenance business and nobody he already said those are structural forces you cannot stop you cannot question you, 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 that, that that's what they want you to tell you that the, the normalcy the normal is the U.S. empire and and the U.S. empire on rampage across the globe? But but let's not focus on that because you cannot stop the U.S. empire. Let's focus on China. And and by the way, uh, when it when it comes to uh, putting these people detaining these people, they had these supposed leaked cables, or they called it China cables, but it was just like a handful of documents. And if you actually read the document versus how they presented it, it's two totally different things. And they are talking about narrowing it down to people who are obviously extremists, who are talking and acting like Salafists, completely uh, different than, than normal Muslim Uyghurs who have been living there for generations. And those are the people that are targeted for reform. They also had an operations manual for the, for the vocational training center, which is what they called it. But before you click on it and read it for yourself, which they know 99.9% .9 of people aren't going to read it. So the, the explanation is like this is a, like a, some kind of detention facility, ethnic detention facility. But when you actually read the, the translation, it says vocational training center. And like the first section is about maximizing safety for the, for the people in the facility, uh, making sure that the, the educational value is maximized. Uh, taking in consideration of the, the people, the trainees, uh, voc uh, occupational aspirations. Like, does that sound like a concentration camp to you? And arranging I, family visits and letters and phone calls that you, you read it and then look at how they've tried to present it. It's night and Another day. thing they even failed to address, the whole vocational training center program has ended in 2019. And, and this was confirmed by the latest AP article. Um, they said they went to all these sites that were formerly uh, uh, Chinese vocation training centers, and now they have been converted to sc regular schools and, and apartment buildings and et cetera. So, so this, this basically, Chinese government had came out in, uh, in summer of 2019, said, the vocational training program is over. We have reintegrated all the all the all the people back into society. You know, at the time, the, there's a couple of articles on New York Times questioning, you know, Chinese government's claim. But the rest of the the pundits, the talking heads, like the Ryan here, are still keep on pushing pushing the story of millions of Uyghur in camp, right? And, and now we, a couple of days after this show aired, we have the AP article which is still very biased but he at least confirms that vacational training center program did indeed end as the chinese government claimed back in 2019 and and so so you know when they're still talking about you know whatever number of we were in detention it's not a thing anymore literally carl did you see in the ap article where they they downgraded it from cultural genocide to light museumification <laughs> yes <laughs> like we thought we were gonna have this big thunderstorm, but it's actually just scattered it's, uh, showers. It's, it, we, we went, yeah, we went from like we literally went from genocide to cultural genocide to museum vacation of Uyghur culture. Because oh, oh, oh yeah. the, the example they gave 
the example they gave, they talk about he went to the Grand Bazaar in Urumqi and said, oh, you know, which has been rebuilt for tourism. I mean, he does not know Grand Bazaar was literally was originally built as a tourist trap to sell you all the kitschy, the kitschy uh, arts and crafts. And it has always been a tourist trap, you know. The, 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 he, he's just making all oh, like the, the, the Ch Chinese people, or Chinese government is like like totally commodifying the, 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 the you know, change the Uyghur culture in the last couple of years and, you know, turning in museumification, museumification. You are no, he's frozen. Very I think he's, oh, he's frozen. He's, he's frozen. He's frozen. Uh, he's frozen <laughs> That's a good, you know, if it was me, I'd be like, my eyes would be like half closed and rolling back into my, but he's like, that looks like a profile shot. There. Yeah. <laughs> so, Guantanamo. Uh, just, yeah. But actually, what, I was listening. I could hear you guys clearly while my connection was bugging yeah. out. The these journalists, it sounds like they're walking back on these claims to save whatever credibility they have as this narrative is crumbling in on them. But just to wrap up my point very quickly, what Ryan did with Guantanamo Bay was exactly what he did with reducing the Muslim world down to two countries was making a very dishonest comparison, saying the war on terror was about Guantanamo Bay, where there's only 12 people uh, there now, which obviously, as Brian made the point, no, it involved millions of deaths. Um, so if you can still hear me clearly, I'll continue on with the clip. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Let's go. Imagination that all of the Uyghurs are suddenly disappearing into these no, they camps. Are. If you go to Shichi, they're there. No, no, you they can see them. They aren't. No, they aren't. But they, this is the, this is a very real fear of the the uh, no, Uyghur people we can't. in Xinjiang. The, right. right. First of all, we can't. Um, we do have satellite images, and we have the testimony of people who have escaped the camps. Um, and you know the the. Those are the you satellite can. images. You can no, go to yeah, Xinjiang. You, yeah, absolutely. AP, <laughs> AP, AP journalists just went to Xinjiang, right? I mean, yeah, they're that's just, just totally a, lying. Yeah, like, they, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you guys uh, have some problems getting out of U.S., you know, because you didn't get your vaccine, but you, you can't go to China. You just get get quarantined for look, the first look, month. Look how confident, look how confident she is about talking about what's going on there also without going there. And then she's talking about the satellite images, which a lot of them come from satellite boy Nathan Rooser from military industrial back to Aspie in Australia. And a lot of those ended up big being like shopping malls and things like that. Um, like, that's what she's talking about. They, they just get these surface points. And then some of them, like there was one uh, there was one Chinese guy in Vancouver that was doing the satellite images also. He, he, he at least put some corrections in place. He puts the corrections in place saying, oh, OK, actually, I was wrong on this one. It was something else. But the damage is usually already done when when they put the initial story out, just like Niall Ferguson, when he put the fake story out about. Uh, international flights leaving from Wuhan during the coronavirus, he put a correction out afterwards and said, I got this wrong, but it doesn't matter anymore. The story's already out there and it's still literally being regurgitated by politicians today, even though yeah. there was a correction on it. Yeah, when Shao no Zhang first... When Xiao Zhang first came out with his claim that uh, the Chinese government demolished the mosque in Khotan, there were thousands of retweets. Uh, but when he put out his correction on a Medium article he wrote... There's like less than a couple hundred retweets, you know? Yep. Yeah. Um, absolutely. The damage is done. All right. Let's and, and this woman oh, and Ryan. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was go just going to go say ahead, this, go this woman and, and Ryan Graham are not going to acknowledge all of those retractions. And then this is the problem when you have so-called witnesses who are literally funded by the U.S. government and, and based in Washington, D.C. And the closest that you can get to Xinjiang uh, allegedly is taking pictures from outer space, then you you don't have a case to make regarding genocide and accusing a country of genocide. This is exactly what they did to Syria too. Uh, some some prison they said was like a, a torture dungeon and the closest they could possibly get to it was taking pictures from outer space. It's it's just absurd yeah. that, that that is considered evidence and it, it's just so flimsy in how people don't realize that this is just them lying again, again and again and again. Absolutely.
Absolutely. And right, there, there are, there's corroborating evidence here. And, and all of the other countries have reason to defend China because they're in bed with China for economic reasons and the way that China supports their economy um, and the way that they hope China will support their economy. But I will say, it, I, I think, you know, the, the reality that people are being put in camps based on their identities, um, it, it's not every Uyghur Muslim, but for the, it is a huge chunk of the Uyghur Muslims that have at least gone. Do you notice she stumbled there? And, and the reason she stumbled is because she doesn't have a good uh, uh, answer to that. She's saying it's not all the Uyghurs. It's the, 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 the I don't know. She does, it, it, Because the, the story doesn't make sense. And it was like, I really liked, Car you know, Carl, when you when you interviewed Arslan Hidiat, you really, I really I liked your approach where you were talking about, he was saying his father was detained. And obviously we found out afterwards he wasn't. He was literally filming commercials for Lincoln Navigator and he just delete he deleted his son off of WeChat because he was a separatist piece of crap. But, you know, you were asking him, why? Why would they do this? And he's like, to, to make an example out of him. He's like, but he was already a model citizen. Yeah, it was just so so they could send a message to let everybody know that, you know, nobody's safe. So nobody's safe, even if you're playing ball. And how do you make an example out of him if after he came out of prison, he's making commercials for Lincoln Navigator again and all this stuff? And it's like the story doesn't make sense. And that's why she has stumbled. She's like, it's not all the Uyghurs. It's the um, a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah, yeah. it's just a yeah, lot yeah. of them. Well, <laughs> well, the right, 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 right answer is that just the people who are involved in extremist activities. But then she can't go there. That's why she's stumbling, saying, uh, I, well, I don't know. Of course, the story doesn't make sense. But this is what we're supposed to say. <laughs> you know. We'll continue on from Gone here. through them and cycled through them and maybe have been released. Um, but at the same time, there's this enormous fear. Um, you right. have members of the CCP going into their homes. Um, it's just an incredible invasion of, of, of privacy and of freedom. And I don't think there's anything, there's any equivalent. They're, they're, liter China, they're literally are not allowed to practice the... their religion. They're literally right. not, oh, not hold allowed on, to practice Hold on, sorry. Hold on, wait. Fish. Hold on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because exactly. Um, I was just, you know, like when you were when you were freezing up back there, I, I had the picture of all, all of the people in the in the mosque. Let me see if I can get it. Um, hold on a second. Any anyway, they they are and the AP, like I said, AP went there. There they are practicing their religion. There they and, and listen, he's gonna he's gonna backtrack because she because she said Salafism. They're not allowed to practice Salafism. And that's true. You're not allowed to practice Salafism because that's like means you're you got to chop everyone's head off who's not Salafist. And remember when at the end of Ramadan, uh, there was a huge dance procession outside of uh, Eid Ka Mosque out in Kashgar. And, and, you know, there was there was multiple videos, you know, on social media from all different angles. And then then people are saying, oh, you know, like the CCP is forcing them to practice their religion. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and apparently they've been paying them for a long time because you, yeah, I think it was you, Carl, who posted yeah. a Japanese documentary from like 1989 or something like that. 1979. Doing, 1979. They're, doing the, they're doing the exact same thing. And it's like, Okay, so they're trying to eradicate their their culture while paying them to continue practicing their culture. Yep, and and and, and interestingly, a lot there, there's a lot of people who are saying, "Oh, but Muslims don't dance. You know, we don't dance on uh like like I don't know, maybe 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 not you, but <laughs> the Muslims in Xinjiang uh, after the end of Ramadan they do dance, and I even have some people from. Uh, Syria and says, you know, I'll, I don't know who, what those guys are talking about, but but we do dance, you know, to celebrate yep. the end of Ramadan. So yeah, there's different versions, there's different interpretation of Islam all across the world. But what Washington is trying to tell you, there's only one. The, Washington's line is the, this media pundit's line, almost like the same as the line from Saudi Arabia, saying there's only one. Yes. version of Islam and <laughs> you must be the version that's practiced in Saudi Arabia. And 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 this yeah. picture right here are imams practicing oh they're students practicing to be imams and they're in a state funded institution that is giving them all of these resources to study and then go out and and preach Islam and 
the AP reporter is like, they were saying that it's free and that it's really great, but the officials were standing nearby. And I, and I, and I want to make this point. The AP journalist is standing inside of a physical building with this happening right in front of his face. He can see it. He can see the building. He can see all of the resources the government gave them to do this. And he's still skeptical. And yet without any skepticism at all, they will accept this hearsay from people in Washington, part of organizations funded by the US government, making claims that constantly shift of which there is no physical evidence. And I just wonder why the, the, they have these double standards where they will believe that, but they're standing inside this physical building with the people standing in front of them and they're witnessing it. And they, and they don't believe, they're still saying, I, I don't believe it. <laughs> you, you, you know what too? Um... There was uh, so Friday.com, a new a new outlet from Hong Kong. They were talking about how Xinjiang is now the number one tourist destination in the world by numbers, even outpacing Paris. Obviously, it's mostly domestic travelers. But what they're saying is that they the people on the outside, they believe that Han Chinese people who are traveling to Xinjiang are potentially witnessing this genocide that's going on. And they're all in on it and they're all staying quiet about it. You know, that nobody's coming out with these stories. I mean, and these people, they could go just as a tourist. You go as a tourist and go in front of Idkar Mosque, go in front of these different mosques in Xinjiang and see for yourself. During the weekdays, the numbers are down and you can see it's mostly old people who are going. On Fridays, you get a bigger crowd. And at the end of holidays, you get huge crowds. Like people can go and verify this for themselves. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe that's I why we're getting say, people. I was yeah, going to go say ahead, Carl. Kim at least interviewed someone who had been there in Xinjiang recently, and that's you, Daniel. And 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 these other two hosts, Ryan and uh, and uh, and Emily, you know, they're just talk. They're just regurgitating the, the the what they read in the mainstream media. You know, they've never been there. So yeah, she interviewed me quite early, and it was it was about. Uh, so yeah, that's right. I was on Kim's show. And it was about she wanted to learn more about the coronavirus lockdown. And I think I said a couple of things that she thought might not be kosher that she thinks was like, you know, she's like, are there, you know, are there police outside of your because I was I was in my brew pub when I was doing that interview. Are there police waiting outside for or coming for you for saying this stuff or, or talking to me? And I said, uh, I just went along with it. I said, yeah, they're there, but they're really friendly. They're waiting for me to finish. But she was, but you're right. She was open minded enough to talk to me. She's got yeah. some pretty bad takes on China still. I think if mm -hmm. I, sure. you know, I've heard from some people, she was pushing the, the lab leak uh, theory and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But, but, but whatever, it's the same kind of a thing. Like with the Australian video where we're talking about it's almost even more beneficiary if they don't, uh, you know, learn the truth about everything and they still believe half of the bullshit because then they're like the gateway drug, as you said. I like that phrase that you used. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, let me continue the video here. Um, that is absolutely no. correct. They're not allowed to practice no. Salafist Sunni Islam which is the more radical version that is what China has banned. That is true. So even if a person's no, not a what criminal- What is this? What is going on here? What you, like, no, there, there's, there's no, there's no, what, what, are, do you think that there's some uh, other mosque that they're able to attend? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Yes. Yes. Yeah, there, there was. Are. There were. Yes. There were. There, were, there are. And, and they're, they're, well, I don't. I don't know what's going on yes. here. What is he talking about? Like that's what. That's exactly what these guys were doing. They had their. Uh, you know. Uh, I, I, let, let, let's continue seeing what he yeah. says. From here. Muslims in China. I mean, there's so there's, there's a, an so there's a Chinese government. So there's so there's one Chinese government. So there's one Chinese government sanctioned mosque that they're allowed to attend, and therefore there's no cultural genocide going on. So th this is like he has to understand also, like in Egypt and all of these countries. The, the mosques are controlled by the state also. They're vetted by the state. And, and, and a lot of these countries, they understand the risks of letting just a Salafist jihadists kind of set up their own operations there as well. Even in Morocco, which is a 99% Muslim country, you know, they ban certain things that they think have a Salafist jihadist kind of uh, um, influences attached to them. For example, they ban the manufacture and sale, I believe it is, of um, uh, niqabs because they feel like that is part of a, a, a radical sect of Islam responsible for a lot of the terrorist attacks in Northern Africa. 
I mean, I mean, this is this is a normal a, a normal thing that happens. But to the main point, absolutely, that's what was going on. They were the main mosques, and there were these underground mosques that were teaching these extremist ideologies. I mean, but but Daniel, I'm sorry, the Muslim nations don't get to have a say on how they. The, the, the Muslim should practice the, the religion of Islam because these are authoritarian government. <laughs> right, <laughs> they're, yeah. they're not liberal democracies. So, you know, right. he, we, we, cannot, we cannot follow their example. Yeah, the and, only and, Muslims we can look at are the ones in America. Let's look at them yes, to see yes. how they are treated. Um, let me think about that. They're put arbitrarily on no-fly lists, and they find out when they show up at the airports. They have FBI agents spying inside their mosques. Um, they, you know, like, yeah, let's, 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 you know, even if we took that as their example, like, come that, on. that's starting to sound like what they claiming is happening in China. You know, like projection. I said, a lot of this is projection. Okay. Yeah. Uh, wait, well, one more point. Ryan Grimm is sitting here moaning and groaning about a Chinese state regulated or sponsored or backed version of Islam. But what is Salafism? It is a Saudi government-backed, sponsored, and directed form of Islam. So you, you're looking at China. We're in China, and we're talking about which government-sponsored version of Islam should be allowed to prevail. And Ryan Grimm is complaining that the Salafist version imported from Saudi Arabia has been uprooted. And we're, we're supposed to feel bad about that when this is the same version of Islam that, that has people chopping people's heads off in Syria right now. He, yeah, he ha they go have ahead. they have been shelling for the war in Syria too. Ryan Grimm is at least very consistent. Yes. Oh, <laughs> he's yeah. very consistent, and 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 not to mention that he's uh, the 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 employer he worked for, the Intercept. You know, he, oh, he was yeah. was uh, was founded by by the eBay founder. You know, billionaire uh, Al Almediar, who obviously has the best interest of us in all of us in heart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, let's continue. Practice. Salafist, yes, it's banned to practice sol sol Salafist. I, I would, I would, I would encourage you to to read some, read some, read some of the dispatches, uh, you know, from people who have ex who have experienced I have this. Extensive research, and, and not and not through the prism of testimony. Uh, some of it, but not all of it. No, I do think that there's definitely, like I mentioned, human rights abuses going on for sure. I mean, it's prison. It's like Guantanamo Bay. There's definitely stuff going on that. Uh, she, this is this is where she's like um, slipping a bit. Uh, you can tell she's like off balance right now, and, and it's it's not like Guantanamo Bay, but she's got a. It's almost like she's got to throw them a bone at this point, and she knows she's under attack. Let's see how it goes. Shouldn't be going on, uh, but to call it a, an ethnic genocide is what I, I take issue with specifically, and I think that's warmongering language. Language. So if you so, but if you but if you compare what the culture was, you know, twenty years ago to what it is today. Would, would, you, would you not acknowledge that they've obliterated the culture? I would say the culture shifted. It became more... It, it like that's, the, that's a weird passive I way mean, to describe to what happened. It didn't, it, didn't well, just, it didn't just passively shift. So, so she's not doing a very good job of explaining her case here. I mean, it, if you say shifted, I mean, so there was, as Brian uh, likes to say, and as I've been saying also for, for, for uh, over a year, the real cultural genocide was happening when these Salafists were coming in and dictating how Uyghurs should live. And then it went back to its original culture, something that, it, 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 you know, looks more like its original culture. But she's not, uh, she wasn't prepared for this ambush, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. The it Chinese shifted. government shifted it, <laughs> right? By policy. And again, I, I like to say, you know, he he have, he said, oh, the culture shifted and the Chinese government shifted. You know, if you go back to the the the, 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 the there twenty years ago. Well, what about going back forty years ago? You know, but you know, I I I was still in China forty years ago. You know, it's very different in Xinjiang. 40, 40, 30, even thirty years ago, it's very still very secular place. Hey, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Yeah, and, and they he that he does not want you to know about that. He just or he doesn't know about it, or he yeah, doesn't yeah, know because yeah, or, or he doesn't know. Yeah, because he's preaching well, well, about the unstoppable war machine, but then he's buying everything being churned out of it to to keep the war machine going. This is this yeah. is what Ryan Grimm does constantly. 
Yep. Well, this there's a really patronizing element to it also, where it's like these people are expecting, you know, people on the other side of the planet to be stuck in time and not have their culture shift. All cultures shifts event, uh, shift eventually. And it reminds me of the post that Timothy Grows, this, uh, you know, um, so-called academic in the U.S. when he was talking about the Chinese government arranging these campaigns as part of their poverty alleviation and lifting people up. They sent people around to teach people how to, you know, uh, uh, hygiene, dental hygiene. And he was talking about that being a form of colonization. It's like he wants these people to dental live Dental colonization. Yeah, they're, they're yeah, yeah, yeah. There's genociding the germs living in your gums. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was unbelievable. Like it was genocide. like he wants these people. Yeah, that's a good one. He wants these people to be living in the past and not develop at all. I mean, really, it's just looking for an excuse that even if... China uplifts its ethnic minorities who they've been coexisting with for centuries, along with everybody else. It's a perfect opportunity to say you're eradicating their culture. It's like, you know, we don't we, the Han Chinese. They don't care that the Han Chinese culture 20 years ago is different than it was now. Like, why isn't he talking about that? It's because they, they don't give a shit about that. This is just an excuse. Of course, the Han Chinese culture 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago is different than it is today. That's what happens in societies. And they, and, they also you know, don't give a shit about Uyghur culture either. It's just an excuse yeah. for them. And, and, they, and they don't and, even know. I'll go ahead, Carl. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to say that that they they talk about this latest culture shift. They didn't know. They He either didn't know or didn't want to talk about the cultural shift that happened 30, you know, 30 years ago when when you know when the when the the practice in the rural Xinjiang become more strict, when when the when the, all these uh, uh, returning Uyghur mujahideen start to enforce their own strict interpretation of Islam in the in the rural villages, and, and that that part is rarely been talked about in um, in the Western media, and what Ch Chinese government is doing is actually a response to that shift that happened. In the rural Xinjiang, and, and and but but of course, you know, we're Americans here. We can't have government mandate change. You know, only private enterprises, only like billionaires, like the the Yi, former eBay founder who who founded Intercept that employs Ryan Grimm is entitled to make change. Right. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's a really good point. I think that does tie into it. All right. Let's see what else he says. We're almost towards the end here. Some the, some rat, more radical religion kind of infiltrated, and we see this happening in lots of areas around the world, as we've seen. Well, more well then more why? Yes, there are there uh, are there are rat there are radicals here in the United States. So does that justify like a massive crackdown sweeping up well, people? Do you think they that had the they had one after nine eleven? They had one. What is he talking about? They the U.S. reconfigured their entire. Uh, domestic security apparatus in response to 9-11. And that was one isolated attack. In Xinjiang, there were attacks killing hundreds of people at a time, uh, uh, all the time, every year, year after year. And then it started to spread uh, to other parts of China. There was a bombing here in Bangkok in 2015 because of these extremists. And then 5,000, around 5,000 went to Syria. That is a large number of people who are who are so... Uh, demented mentally and 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 brainwashed by this this cult uh, to make the the decision to go all the way to Syria and fight alongside Al Qaeda and ISIS. Like, what what kind of mindset must you be in to go through all of that just to go fight in Syria? And why are they fighting in Syria? Because it was never about them being upset with the policies in Beijing. It was this obsession with jihad, their their idea of what jihad was, and they didn't care where they had to go. To, to pursue it. So if you just if you just push back with Ryan Grimm, people uh, talk, uh, giving this excuse, this this reason, if you just push back a little bit, they can, they cannot exp uh, they cannot account for this. Yeah, yeah. I actually I, read I, interviews with uh, with some uh, Uyghur exiles in Turkey. Uh, I think this was done by uh, NHK, the Japanese uh, uh, TV network. And they they have been told when in China that you know once they leave China they can practice their own you know very strict brand of Islam and when so they when they went to Turkey you know they thought okay now we're in a Islamic uh, a majority country we're going to 
be able to practice that. And they were shocked how secular Turkey was because they had expected that once they get out of China, it's just, you know, it's just like we're returning to the true Islam. And then they went to Turkey and they were shocked that Turkey is such a secular country. Yeah, no. Uh, no, absolutely. And he's drawing these false equivalents also. Like, I mean, even though they crack down on people uh, in the U.S., you know, with the Patriot Act, with the no-fly list and things like that, there's no equivalence with what China was facing in terms of, like, you've got over 10,000 Uyghur fighters in Syria now, you know, for, that, that, is, that left from Xinjiang. Literally hours after his show, there was a Uyghur that blew himself up in a mosque in northern Afghanistan, like there's no equivalence with what China was facing with what the U.S. was facing. And then again, once again, if you're comparing the response to the war on terror, what China's method was, was identifying people who were radicalized, you know, giving them skills training and things like that. And they went home on the weekends, by the way. These were absolutely schools comparing it to what America did, you can't look at what America did with their domestic populations. You have to look at what did they do with the war on terror? The war on terror expanded beyond their own borders, beyond their own sovereign territories. And it involved bombing the shit out of people. You know, it was like, um, you know, I'm going to play a short clip here. Let me play a short clip here. Let, let's see. It, it, not only how did, uh, the U.S. handle terrorists that had anything to do with the U.S. Let's look at how the U.S. handled Uyghur terrorists. And I'll play a clip from 2018, November 7th, or sorry, February 7th, 2018, General Heckler. I think you've seen this before. I'm going to play this. It's about a one and a half minute clip. Over the past weekend, United States forces conducted air operations to strike Taliban and East Turkestan Islamic Movement, or ETIM, training facilities in Badakhshan province. The destruction of these training facilities prevent terrorists from planning any acts near the border with China and Tajikistan. The strikes also destroyed stolen Afghan National Army vehicles and the process of being converted to vehicle-borne imp improvised explosive devices. One brief note on in ETIM, which I just mentioned. They are a terrorist organization that operates in China and the border regions of Afghanistan. ETIM enjoys support from the Taliban in the mountains of Badakhshan. So hitting these Taliban training facilities and squeezing the Taliban support networks degrade ETIM capabilities. What I'd like to do is show you a couple videos of strikes in this area in Badakhshan. The first one that you're gonna see is a B-52 strike on a Taliban training camp in Badakhshan. Adrian, can you please roll the tape? This strike occurred on 4 February. That's how they handle Uyghur extremists, the US. Not, 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 not uh, skills training, not, you know, not vocational training, none of this stuff that, that they just get, bl they blow the shit out of them. And if you want to talk about, if you want to talk about um, innocent casualties, if you want to talk about the idea that, okay, when they were going after, and, and we, you've got to forget about these ridiculous million, two million numbers that there, that there's no support for, but whatever, even if you were to say, even if you were to concede and say that maybe there were some people that ended up in these camps that shouldn't have been in there. Like they had some extremist material on their phones, but it wasn't really their fault or whatever. Well, what is the what is the um, what's the word collateral damage? Co collateral damage. You know exactly what I want to say. The the collateral damage when the U.S. is going after a Uyghur fighter somewhere else. So if you look at like for example, uh, Uyghurs in uh, Raqqa in uh, Syria, there were over four hundred Uyghur families there. They were obviously there with the people who escaped from Xinjiang. A lot of them are fighting alongside other terror groups. And so let's see how the U.S. handles Raqqa. Well, when they bombed, the coalition forces bombed there, they killed 1,600 innocent civilians along with them. That was the casualty rate of how they deal with things. And again, this is outside of their own borders. This is not in their own country. So now we're talking about China within their own borders, not extended beyond their own borders, deciding to handle things this way with re-education programs. And even if you don't like them, and there's probably reason to not like many aspects of it, it's uncomparable 
But what what people like Grimm tries to do, Ryan Grimm tries to do, is they try to draw these false equivalents, and they're just way in in, in totally different galaxies. Uh, absolutely, mm -hmm. and you, you know, you're, you're you're talking about that, and you're talking about uh, China reforming people, and yet there probably were isolated cases of of abuses inside these these detention facilities. That's probably true. I, I don't think that it's uh, any large institution with lots of people, I mean, you're going to have these things happen, but it wasn't a matter of policy. And even the, the papers that they've, you know, leaked don't indicate that. They indicate that that, that by, by every measure, Beijing was trying to reform these people and return them to society. And then watching that footage of a B-52 just blow the top off of a mountain and everybody on it. And, and then when you compare it, and then like when you listen to Ryan Grimm, like people should look at that and then listen to Ryan Grimm talk, talk again, because it really does, you know, contrast the US approach and China's approach, and then this feigned concern for human rights. And, and he has to know that this is just them doing to China what they did in the lead up to do, doing that, that we just saw in that video to Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, let's continue on. The party has changed. Do you think it's become more radical right wing? I mean, things change. I just don't think that's a productive, I guess, parallel. And it seems to me that we're not going to agree on the scale of the abuses. But I do right. think that we can agree that we can have, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, that there are different things going on. Um, and that's the, I right. guess. There, I mean, there were a handful of terrorist attacks. Yes. There were also there are also terrorist attacks here in the United States. We would never say, OK, well, then therefore a handful. Like, therefore, we have to go and invade a country and kill a million people. Therefore, that's exactly we would never yeah, say that. Good. Yeah. Therefore, we have to invade two countries, Iraq and <laughs> yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah. And yeah. one of them had absolutely nothing to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> really, none of them. We're, going, we're going to Saudi ban this the Christians. And, and it's an ethnic and it's on the basis of an ethnic identity. This is not just a religious identity. It's an ethnic identity. Right. Yeah. It's it, it depends. Right. I, there. But I don't agree that they're actually doing that. I, I think that the, that, that you, is, but you, it's but not, you, it's you just did agree to it. You said that you, you did agree that the culture that I exists that today is some. radically different. It, no, As some a of result it, some of Chinese the, policy, it's been suppressed on a. a mass no, scale. I don't agree with that. That's not what I said. But I'll do a whole piece on the Uyghurs, and we can we can talk about this. No, let's not time. actually do that. <laughs> Let's, let's not try not. to get to the bottom of it. Let's not let's debate. Not. Let's not talk about it because because we were already just hanging by our fingertips this entire segment. So let's please, please let's let, let's, on our fingers. Let's not that, challenge the religious orthodoxy. You know, please. That that is the key right there. Let, let's not, you know, uh, he, he, so he's asking Kim, I suggest you read until you read enough to re you know, or the right things to reach the same conclusion I have. But when Kim says, you know, what, let me bring some other facts from the other side. No, let's not do that. You know, it's like, th 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 this is, this is something that he's trying so hard, a narrative that he's trying so hard to preserve. And you can see right through it. I mean, let, let's, there's a few seconds left. I think it's pretty much at the end. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Go. Well, thank let's you so go. much for watching. Yeah. We'll have more rise coming up. Uh, it's it's hard to tell if Ryan Grimm is is just a complete ignoramus when it comes to Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, the entire situation. What what Xinjiang was like before Salafism started uh, overriding the indigenous culture there. Uh, what it was like. He said there were a handful of attacks. Uh, I recommend people watch the CGTN documentary about Xinjiang and don't don't listen to anything that they're saying just look at the CCTV footage of these attacks how brutal they were and we're talking about people walking up to complete strangers strangers who did absolutely no wrong to them and they just walk up with a knife and just start sawing at their neck that is not something a normal person does that's not something that's driven by some sense of injustice against Beijing's policies these were people completely out of their mind they were extremists and what do you do with that? There's two things that you can do. You can bomb them like the US did, or you could try to reform them. And it's just like uh, somebody described it one time. It's like when you're dealing with a virus and you you know this person is infected and then you try to, to trace it back to all the other people around them that, that might also have been infected by the Salafism that was imported deliberately, deliberately to foment separatism, violence, and terrorism. 
the U.S. was doing to Xinjiang exactly what they did to Afghanistan to get the Soviets out, and then what they're doing in Syria right now to try to overthrow the government in Damascus. They were doing the exact same thing in Xinjiang. So it was pr practically a proxy war, and yet China did not go in there as if it was actual warfare. They tried to reform these people. They put a lot of effort and invested a lot in that, and the way the U.S. has twisted it and to genocide, it's just absurd. And, and it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. And you you saw what happened. Ryan Grimm and that, that other woman, I cannot remember her name. Emily. Emily. Yeah, their lies like broke and, and went around as if like water hitting, hitting a rock. It just couldn't stand up to scrutiny yeah. at all. And, and and that's the thing though too is that you don't even have to you don't even have to believe that there's a geopolitical interest to ramp up tensions or get us potentially into another war based on false pretenses. You don't even need to believe those parts of it. You can just see the way that this conversation is being approached is incredibly dishonest. I mean, you know that that final statement from Ryan, like yeah, let's not do that. Yeah, let's not look for facts that. That, that, that contradict this narrative that I'd like to believe in. I mean, that sums it up e e even without that. You don't need to believe in the geopolitical interests. The discourse around this issue is being approached in a very dishonest way. If, if you really believe in, in uh, a topic or a cause, when you see there's people skeptical of it, you would always want to make time to try to explain it, to try to clarify things so that people understand what's really happening. So if Ryan Grimm is serious. He he really thinks that there's some sort of genocide going on. Why wouldn't he want to address skepticism and and really lay out the facts and make it as clear as possible? And it's it's probably because one he is pretty ignorant and number two I think he is deliberately dishonest and and Carl you keep touching on it with that that funding behind the intercept and and you can see how the intercept has gone downhill and what he's done regarding Syria that has to be deliberate. There's, there's no way he, he honestly believes any of that. And, and also remember Syria. Th th there has long been a, uh, a, also a narrative that Assad is committing Sunni genocide, right? That is why we have to. That, that, that is actually the, the, the rally slogan for a lot of the jihadists all across the world to rush to Syria because there's a Sunni genocide in Syria, and, and, and that's. That they're 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 playing the exact same playbook on Xinjiang, basically. Just just the different actors are changed. Exactly. No, absolutely. Did you guys have? Uh, I you know two two we're over two hours again. We should have known this was going to happen. You know we got we got we got a much shorter video, a seventeen minute video. I said, all right, we're going to get this done in an hour. But we you know <laughs> this is what happens again. But a lot of people watched our last one all the way through. So, uh, yeah. but I mean, we, you know. we, we cram into a, a, a lot of other content too. For example, we covered the AP article that just came out because, yeah. And, yeah. and also, yeah. uh, we also talk about that CNN witness, the police, the police, the, right. the cosplay guy, the police cosplay guy. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, it goes beyond uh, just that. Obviously, my connection didn't help also, but we can trim this down afterwards. But yep. um, I don't really have anything else I want to add to that. I think we touched on a lot of really good stuff. If you guys had any final thoughts or anything like that? Carl? Brian? <laughs> I think I'm good. <laughs> I think, yeah, we, no, I I think just... we got everything. Yeah, yeah, I think we got yeah. pretty much everything. You go ahead, Brian, if you've got something. Well, I, I just want people to, to look at that LA Times article about the Salafism pouring in to Xinjiang and overriding the indigenous Islam that, that Uyghurs have been practicing for generations. That is so key to understanding all of this and exposing the lies. And uh, if someone just took that, you know, printed it out, and when Ryan Grimm was saying that and just slap it down in front of him, what would he say to that? What would he say when, when he realizes that the actual cultural genocide was coming from state-sponsored Salafism and that the, the Chinese sponsored version of Islam is closer to what Uyghurs had been practicing and what had had harmony in Xinjiang before Salafism was trying to override it and caused all of that very real terrorism. And again, that CGTN, I mean, you have to have a strong stomach, I guess, if you're not used to seeing stuff like that, but it's horrific. And when you see that, you realize that it's not, 9-11 was one isolated attack in Xinjiang it was terrorism. It was an. It was an. It was a climate of fear and terror, and then it was expanding outside of Xinjiang. 
and this is what everyone living there and what the government was dealing with. And it's not, you cannot compare it. So uh, Ryan Grimm wants to talk about false comparisons. That is a false comparison to, to pretend like, like, could you imagine if they were attacking police stations in the US and, and killing like 20 cops at a time? What, how the US government would react to that if that was happening yeah. like every other month? Because that's what was happening in Xinjiang. And Ryan Grimm, does, he's a handful of attacks. Right. Yeah, no, he, he really what year? Is. What year was that LA Times article, Brian? Uh, 2016. I can uh, put it back up on the, where is it? Right here. In, in China, rise of Salafism fosters suspicion and division amongst Muslims, 2016. And if you do some Google searches and you, you do like a, you know, the time frame, and, and look for older articles, you'll actually find a lot of articles on this topic. And if you read a lot of older articles about the, the terrorism in Xinjiang, because like the BBC used to make like paragraphs and paragraphs of all the, the deadly terrorist attacks that, that were taking place recently. And now they never mention it. Just like Ryan Grimm, they just, oh, there, you know, uh, the government in China said it was terrorism and it'll be like in quotation marks. But a couple of years ago, they used to like list all these horrific attacks in, in detail. And so it's a campaign of deception and, and they're still doing it. They're still trying to do it. Even as AP, they, they have the article coming out, debunking, pretty much walking back from it. But people like Ryan Grimm are still trying to push it into areas of society that are still receptive to it, even though it's totally debunked. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to uh, point out there that the Chinese vocational training, whatever re-education camp, whatever you call it, that program has ended in 2019. Now we're in 2021, you know, like there's a reason why people like Ryan Grimm and other talking heads are still pushing the millions of Uyghur in camp story because they want to keep that story going. They And they're doing that on purpose. This is definitely an orchestrated media campaign. You, and you got to ask you the question why, why they do that. I, um, I, I keep saying I'm going to release this video and I've got to do it. I've got my old laptop fixed now, so I have the files. But I actually visited three of the sites that people said were the concentration camps. And um, when I went there, so that was, I actually, halfway through my trip to Xinjiang. So the first half of my trip, I didn't tell anybody I was going. I went on my own. I was just walking around talking to people. But the last half of the trip, I reached out to people. It took a lot of work. And I said, I want to visit some of these places. And they said, you could just go by yourself. Just take the taxi, take a taxi and drive, drive by it if you want. And I said, no, I want to go inside if that's possible. And they're like, um, okay, well, let me, let, let's see what we can do. Because this was just shortly after my video went viral with, uh, there was a, a video that the, uh, uh, the foreign affairs in, uh, uh, shared. They ripped down my video from YouTube and they shared it. I don't know if you remember that one. It was from a panel. But anyway, so there was a little bit of trust there. Um, but then finally, they said to me, they said, uh, they called me back and they said, yeah, OK, you know, what? We, uh, uh, give, give us the uh, actually I hadn't given them the coordinates by that time. They said, give us the coordinates. But if it turns out to be an actual real prison, obviously you can't go in. And I, I said, yeah, sure. I understand. I gave it to them and they took me there. And these buildings were empty. They, they actually were converted. A part of it was converted into a covid uh, isolation center. For example, if people were coming back from high risk provinces or from overseas, they would be quarantined in these places. And they said that they used to be not the vocational training schools for the de-radicalization, but they were the um, they were the regular vocational uh, high schools like they have all over the country. Uh, I've got friends who went to some of them in uh, Jiangxi, but they were I, I was I, I didn't know how to process it like i didn't know if they were lying to me if they really were the de-radicalization centers but then even if they were um they were obviously decommissioned which would align with the story that in 2019 they were all decommissioned now they kept saying the, the reason that they stopped using these vocational schools was because they built a better school a better and a bigger school and then finally after the third site i visited i'm like does this story really make sense i said okay take me to the new one then if you say you built a new one and they did and it was, yeah, it was indeed, you could see it was freshly built. There was a football field in the back, but I didn't really know how to present that story. I, I, I was like, I don't, I didn't even really understood what was going on. But the key point is, is that everything lined up with the uh, idea that these things don't exist anymore, even if they were lying to me about it. Um, but, and if you, yeah. if you read this AP article, 
this is basic. Like if you could read between the lines and, and the deception, they're still trying to slip in there. They're basically telling you that everything that the Chinese government had said from start to finish regarding this entire situation in Xinjiang was true. And, and he's, he's touring all of the evidence of that. He's showing it to you and, and the cultural genocide there they've at, at the very end of like the last paragraph, he's talking about this, experience he had with two officials in Xinjiang and he was sitting with them. They were eating Uyghur food and they were watching Uyghur performers dancing in front of him. And he, he acted as if when they said, how could we have genocide here? We're preserving the culture. And the way he wrote it was like, but are they? And it's like, there, there's <laughs> literally a Uyghur dancing in front of you. He's living and breathing and dancing in front of you. And you're still casting doubt on it. And then, and, and then just like Ryan Grimm, what you, or that other lady, oh, you don't believe the testimony. So, so physical evidence, skepticism, someone in Washington, DC making uh, baseless claims. This is something that we should, we should give serious weight and consideration to. Yeah, and, and, I mean, both and both sides should be actively seeking out information to disprove themselves. So when I was talking about that trip, I was deliberately being as skeptical as possible. And I even said when when they said that they were going to uh, when they finally said, OK, we'll take you there. Um, I said to them, I said to them clearly, I said that. I uh, I want you to know that I'm not necessarily only going to say good things. Like I said, if I if I see something that's concerning, I'm going to say it. And they said, that's fine. We, we didn't ask. They said to me, they said, we never asked anybody to only say good things. We only ask people to be honest. And the, the, the sense I got from that response was all of these journalists, BBC, AP and all of these things, all these people, when they go in, they're not being honest. I mean, even the BBC report, when they went into the vocational training centers, you can see that they said that it's a prison. But then they try to dismiss at the end of the documentary when they see all when they saw all the people going home every weekend. Um, they didn't say, oh, we were wrong. It's not a prison. Oh, actually, they can go home. They said, wow, this just show look at the buses they've arranged for them. This just shows you the scale of the operation. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, I had one question for you, Daniel, because I, I remember yeah. and and. And Carl, I don't know if you ever went to into a bookstore when you visited Xinjiang, but uh, more recently, when you went into these bookstores, were there were were there just books in Uyghur about Mao Zedong and Xi Jinping, or were there other titles? Yeah, there was um, there was literally like Henry Kissinger translated into Uyghur. <laughs> There was a Henry Ki Henry Kissinger's book was translated into Uyghur, and the Uyghur section was all on the first floor. If you wanted English or or um, a simplified Chinese books, you had to go up to the second floor in the back. But they, yeah, they literally they literally had Henry Kissinger's book. I mean, how weird is that um, in Uyghur? Script, I wonder so. if they had a 1984 translation uh, in, in Uyghur. Because I <laughs> but, but, one thing my yeah. friends did is uh, in in Yunnan. I visited uh, my friend David Emilia in Yunnan. He took me to a local bookstore, and we found a copy. Of 1984, you know, people don't people don't believe it. People don't believe that book has been sold. You know, it's legal in China, but there it is. It's in in China in the bookstore. 1980, and it's not even translation. It's like English, the original English. 1984, right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, having Henry Kissinger's book translated into Uyghur, I think, is still <laughs> you know <laughs> pretty spectacular. But, but that that ties into what I was saying about deliberately looking for information to prove your own position wrong. That's what you should do with anything you believe in life. And before I went on that specific trip to Xinjiang, that's exactly what I did is I reached out to all of the most prolific or not all, a, a few of the most prolific anti-China people. And I asked them, I said, if you were going to Xinjiang, what would you be looking for? What questions would you want to ask? And I was going from their perspective. I wanted to get into their frame of mind and saying, I want to go. I want to approach this from the perspective of somebody who believes there's a genocide going on. Um, and, and if the other side did that more often, I think they would see how ridiculous this whole thing is. Yeah, absolutely. Because like, look what this AP person is doing. They just, uh, there could be all kinds of books in this bookstore, but they just choose to pick these, these books with, with president Xi Jinping's picture on it. As if that's the only book available. If you read Uyghur, you're out of luck because you're this is if all they, you get. Yeah. This is if what they they're trying to picture, depict though. If they took a picture of um Henry Kissinger's book uh, in Uyghur, it would have been it would have just destroyed their narrative. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs>
I'm, I'm gonna you you guys if you have anything else to say i'm I'm gonna try to find the image so i can show you guys uh it'll take me a second if you've got anything yeah else yeah to yeah add. take 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 your time take your time um well, yeah but i, I, I do i do think i do have a, a a a you know my thoughts on why the ap article is coming out at a time like this because it, it does look like they're walking back from their genocide narrative right now and I suspect it may be tied to the, the recent effort by the Biden administration to cool up, cool down the, 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 the rhetoric between China and U.S. Because right currently, uh, Biden administration is engaging in trade talks again with China. Um, they're, they're trying to roll back some of the, 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 the Trump era sanctions and tariffs on China. Right. And. And this AP may be, you know, part of that effort to kind of walk back from this whole Xinjiang genocide narrative. And, you know, still they have to throw in all the, all the, oh my God, that's epic. <laughs> that's, that's, the that's my picture. That really I took that, my picture. I took that picture in the bookstore. <laughs> all, yeah, no, I mean, only, only I mean, Xi Jinping books. And, and when I, when I, when I, yeah, so that, that guy could have totally taken a picture of the American books that were translated into Uyghur. And, and the interesting thing is, I mean, I love this story too, because when I went in, I was filming the bookstore and then the Uyghur staff started like kind of yelling at me. They're like, oh no, no, you can't film in here. And then, um, I, I was like, oh, okay, that's weird. It's like, is this like a government rule that I can't film the evidence of this cultural genocide? Um, so I said, is this a, it's like a service you could is this like a, a government rule? And they they were like, uh, no, this is just because we don't want our competitors to see our lay like have all of our information <laughs> on what, what books we sell. And then so I said to them, I was like, uh, listen, I'm not from Kashgar. Here's the situation. I'm, I'm not Uyghur because I, I had some I, I remember yeah. I was in a pharmacy and they, they started speaking to me in Uyghur. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and uh i was like no 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 i was so i, I said oh, what and, and and so they speak enough mandarin and then they stopped talking to me and they started talking to each other and they're like oh uh uh, uh Amer they the word they used for american and uyghur yeah. it sounded like american it was like americano yeah. or something like that uh -huh. and, and and i i could i could guess what they were saying and i said well bus a megoran and then they're like, "Ooh, you know, yo, you're man, you know, you're, you're is good. So, so I told these people in the in the bookstore, I'm like, I'm not Uyghur, I'm not from Kashgar, I'm not the competition. It's just overseas people are saying you're not allowed to have Uyghur books in Xinjiang anymore, and I want to prove them wrong. And they looked at each other like I was crazy, like I was from another planet. They're like, these these freaking foreigners are weird. And they're like, okay, whatever. And then so that's okay. when I started taking pictures and I filming. Yeah. I'm going but, to ask you a question, uh, Daniel, since, you know, you could pass for Uyghur. Did, were you, did you felt you were treated differently when you were traveling in Xinjiang versus other part of China? I think maybe I blended in a little bit more, like maybe some people, especially when I was wearing my mask, just kind of disregarded me. Um, but it was the same warm, friendly kind of uh, feelings. Like if I go to Hunan or Jiangxi or something and they see that I'm an outsider and they know I'm an outsider from somewhere else, they were um, they were really, you know, people in China, Han Chinese, very, very friendly. They want to find out, you know, a little bit more about me. Where am I from? They find out I'm from Canada and they talk about, you know, uh, uh, Bai Chu Wen, the famous Canadian doctor. They're, they're very happy to talk to me. In Xinjiang, when Uyghurs recognized, when they realized I wasn't from there, also very, very friendly, wanted to ask me, oh, where am I from? How many kids do I have? Very, very friendly talking to me. Now, one thing, one thing I will say, though, that I did notice before going to Xinjiang is that Uyghurs who are living outside of Xinjiang, like that I've met in Hunan or different places, they're a bit more reserved. They're a bit more to themselves. Um, they, they, don't, they don't open up as much. Still very, very friendly. Um, but in Xinjiang, you know, very warm and welcoming. And, but that's the similar kind of a treatment that I've got everywhere in China. Well, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get some racial profiling stories on you, man. I'm trying to get <laughs> I'm trying to did get you, you to tell you tell your race experience being racial profile. Well, you're talking Chinese about like author, authorities or something. Yes, like that. yes, oh. yes. Yeah, did you get get stopped in the checkpoint more? You know, uh, no. <laughs> okay. Did you have no. uh, cadres of Han Chinese shouting to you in Uyghur? 
Yeah. To not, to not answer questions. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. There's okay. nothing. I mean, they pretty much, I, I tried to deliberately interact with some of the police. Like, you know, if I like more or less knew where I was going, I, I, I still asked for directions or something like that. I just wanted these interactions. I wanted to interact with people. I mean, most of the police officers were Uyghur anyways. Um, uh, you know, the, at the checkpoints, I was with somebody who was Han Chinese in the car and at the checkpoints, the, 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 the like the people in the military uniforms, I guess they were PLA, they were actually all Uyghur as well. And they, they, uh, and their, their Mandarin actually wasn't that good. They, they were struggling to communicate with the Han guy in the car. Um, so, I mean, how's that for, how's that for cultural genocide? <laughs> you know, even the PLA and, officers there, you know, in, in those China cables there, the one court case that they had there, if you look at who the judges were, all of uh, their names Brian were Uyghur. You froze. Oh, or did I? Maybe it's me. Okay. You, you said yeah, China cables, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the, the the China cables, they had one of the documents was a court ruling where this guy was obviously saying things that only a Salafist would say. And so they they sentenced him. And then all the way at the, the last pages, the judges who ruled on it, and they were all Uyghur names that that ruled right, yeah. on this case. Yeah. Which which yeah. They, no, you that, know, they never mentioned that in the when they're describing these documents. No, that, that yeah, that's the thing. I, I mean, there were a lot of people who they really didn't and there's people in the middle too there's people who really don't like these salafist jihadists but they also didn't like the chinese government approach they thought they just kind of steamrolled through and did things and so you know what one of my kazakh friends from xinjiang it was the same kind of a thing where when he was in university he tried pork for the first time in his life and it was with han, han chinese friends and when he went back to um to the university he had some his, like fellow Kazakh classmates. They invited uh, them into into his into their dorm room, and he was like, "Oh, this is cool. We're gonna go for like some sort of a party. I'm gonna get to hang out with the other Kazakhs." And they beat him up. They they all ganged up on him and they beat him up. And uh, it was because he was hanging out with Han Chinese, and they were you know they, they he, he tried pork, and he um, they didn't he he said to me he said he doesn't hold it against them and they didn't really give it to him to the point where they were trying to kill him or anything like that they just bruised him up a bit um but even they they wouldn't be considered because there were there were these ethnic divides where people were being convinced they aren't able to live with each other and things like that and even those guys who targeted him they wouldn't even be considered extremists I mean, they, they were, it, it's unfortunate they had this xenophobia problem and they had these cultural issues that they had to work out, but that was mild compared to what the actual real Salafist jihadists were doing. I mean, they were going around with knives. There were stories of them cutting off people's ears who were drinking alcohol, uh, you know, if they got drunk and kind of fell asleep or something like that. I mean, it was a really, really serious yeah. situation. And yeah, and they weren't just targeting Han Chinese; they were targeting Uyghur as well, who the the ones they considered non-practicing. Yeah. What, yeah, what 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 was really really interesting, and I've never I've never mentioned this on 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 my, on my channel before, was the uh, the Uyghurs or the Kazakhs who can see through the Western media BS and who hates what they're doing, especially when you're talking about sanctioning them, sanctioning cotton and stuff like that, because they're like, now now you're just trying to fuck with us. You know, now we, now we can you, you're, you're just like you're not actually trying to help us. But what was interesting, one of the guys, because I, I desperately try to seek out people who have issues with the government to hear the other side of the story. And what he said is he has kind of a love hate relationship with the Western media because he said when the crackdowns were happening, they were severe, but they were nothing like what the Western media was painting them out to be. You know, there were a lot of restrictions that were added. And he knows that the Western media is not out there for truth. He knows that the Western media is not out there to help the ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. However, he said the pre he feels that the pressure from the Western media caused the government to not go further or to, you know, be a little bit more easy on the situation, be a little bit more conscious about what they were doing and how they were doing it. So he felt like maybe the situation could have been worse without the Western media. So that's that's an interesting perspective also. It's a love-hate relationship with the Western media, even though he knows they're full of shit and they're not out there to help him. I could see that. And that's why it's it's, it's so much more uh, nuanced. It's so much more uh, complicated than what they're making it out to be. But what, what, what people in the West are reducing it down to is just absolutely dishonest. It's not meant to help anybody. Um, ultimately, in the end, it's going to cause more uh, uh, damage than good. Um, 
Yeah. That, that's what Ryan uh, Grimm actually didn't address. He he make it as it is our moral obligation to stand up and speak for these people. But he he he, he again he's making it about more about him about about the people. Oh, we gotta do this. But what effect you're you, you're not helping. You know, whatever Ryan Grimm is doing, it's not helping actual Uyghur people on the ground in Xinjiang. Yeah. And I, yeah. I don't know if that's his intention in, in the in the first place. Yeah, well, the I mean, key, re a really important thing to keep in mind, too, is although he has this love-hate relationship with the media, the Western media could have accomplished the same thing with an honest approach. They could have done it without blowing it out of proportion. There was no need to go that far. But that's all they had. You know, they either had the, the, the Chinese government side and they had the Western media side. Both sides were on their kind of extremes, especially the Western media side. Th that's all they had. But it would have been much better if the Western media just had an honest approach from the beginning. And it would have been much better if the West actually really cared about Uyghurs and Kazakhs and ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. But the truth is they don't really give a shit about them. Yeah, and I, I was going to say uh, Ryan Grimm knows what speaking up about this and making this an issue, he knows where that's going to lead because w what is anyone going to do about it? You know, what what does he imagine governments are going to do about it? Governments in the West, what are they going to do about it? These sanctions, how are these going to help anyone in, in Xinjiang? And he knows, he, he knows what has happened in the past and he's acting like this time it's going to somehow be different. And that's how you can kind of know he's being dishonest, because there's no way he's that naive to think this time everything is going to be different. So I, I think it's really important. Yeah, And we to, have the to, benefit of history behind us as well, too, to say, OK, so when we do intervene on, uh, you know, hand, uh, uh, on humanitarian basis, uh, on a humanitarian basis, what's the final result? What comes out of it? And the 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 success rate doesn't paint a pretty picture about what happens after that intervention. So, you know, I, I, I mean, even if you were intervening on legitimate reasons, what do you think? Yeah. What do, what do you think is actually going to happen? I think that's a valid uh, a valid uh, question to, for people to ask themselves as well. Yeah. So it's so, important to um, keep pointing yeah. these things. It's, it's important to keep pointing these things out. So I think that's why it was important for us to, to get together and kind of pick yep. this apart. And and, yeah. and it's almost another three hours again. Yeah, <laughs> so I, think we can cut, I think we can cut some of some come, cut some of it. Down yeah, my, in, in my connection issues will be uh, cut out. And I promise you, I'm sorting my connection out soon. Um, and we'll be good to go next time. And maybe we can eventually turn this into, once I get my connection issues sorted out, into a live stream format, maybe on like oh, Friday yeah. nights or Thursday nights or something. <laughs> um, yeah, audience, yeah. please let us know if you want to see that. Um, I think that will be fun too. But of course, I've got to get my connection issues sorted out first. Yes. But oh, I will okay. just end on um, saying, yeah, what, what I said again, just seek out information to disprove yourself. And I'm not only saying that to the other side. I'm saying that to people who agree with our point of view also. Seek yes. out information, read those documents, because that, that, that's what we do, too. We're reading those leaked documents. A lot of those leaked documents weren't really leaked documents. They were the literal Xinjiang terrorism white papers that are published on the Internet. It's just they added the word leaked so that when they used their creative interpretation of what their documents um, uh, said, it sounded more nefarious. Um, I mean, and most of the time we are using the Western media reports to debunking the Western media claims. So yeah, yeah. they can't, they exactly. can't accuse us using, using Chi unreliable Chinese sources because we're literally using their own words. We're using their yeah. words to actually debunk what they're, what, you know, what, 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 what the narrative is out there, what they're putting out. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's what I would end on. So maybe maybe we wrap this up here, guys. And uh, the next time we have a reaction video, we will uh, we'll probably end up being three hours again. But I think this is fun <laughs> and valuable. So, okay. you know, thanks very much for joining Brian and Carl. And uh, thanks, everybody who lasted this long. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Peace. Take care, guys. All right. All right.